The events take place in one of the states located in the northern latitudes. Before us is a stretch of harsh winter taiga. Mighty silent fir trees are languishing under the weight of snow. There is not a sound, only the piercing howl of the intensifying blizzard. In the middle of the snowy clearing, the silhouette of a young woman is clearly visible. What is she doing here? The snow cover around her is untouched by footprints. Her clothes are light, her feet are bare, her face is pale and clear as ice. Her silver hair is ruffled by a harsh, cold wind. Here she meets her imminent death, and she does not resist. Beautiful violet eyes look at the devastated world with complete indifference to what is happening. An ever-increasing blizzard slowly but inevitably sweeps away the unexpected guest who came here on her last visit. There is only cold, cold sky and inaccessible in its majesty and indifference rocks around. The girl answers them with the same indifference. It seems that soon her breath will freeze completely and another life will cease to exist in this world. Suddenly, the silence is broken by an exclamation of surprise. A horseman has made his way through the snowdrifts and bad weather to the edge of the forest. It's incredible, he said, trying to comprehend what was happening. The man dismounted. He came closer. He took a closer look. At first glance, she might have looked like an ice statue. Even on her deathbed, this woman lies with dignity and natural nobility, he thought, as if this snowy field and everything around her belonged to her. He looked around. Maybe it would be possible to understand what had happened here. There was no one around, only bare fir trees. The traveler crouched over his unexpected and unusual find. The girl was nearly unconscious, but there were still traces of life in her. You are not unfaithful, Empress, he said. Well, if you choose to give up your life so easily, he continued. The girl struggled to open her eyes, her lashes already frozen. She tried to see the man leaning over her. The silhouette reminded her of something, but she couldn't make out what or who. Her thoughts were disjointed, confused. She was ready to fall into eternal sleep. I will gladly take you with me. The man continued the sentence he had started earlier. The girl was indifferent. Her hands were lowered. Her eyes were closed. The traveler lifted the girl slightly and supported her head. He held her close. You are mine now, he said. Three months ago, in the palace of the Thanatos Empire, the very events that left the Empress alone, frozen in the snowy taiga on the verge of death, took place. The Emperor is in his private chambers. He is half naked. It's time! Kill the Empress says a female voice. Use Natasha, your majesty. The owner of this voice, the emperor's mistress, Natasha, approaches him from behind, puts her arm around him, and continues to speak in a conspiratorial tone. The emperor listens obediently and attentively to her words. Get rid of the empress and strengthen your position, the woman insinuates to the emperor. This goes on for more than a day and a night. Taking advantage of the emperor's intimacy and passion, Natasha influences him in the direction she wants. In the end, the persistent and purposeful actions of the emperor's mistress have had an effect. The thought that had been implanted in him was firmly fixed in his mind, and he began to think about how to realize it. In the ice and gold empire of Thanatos, everything must belong to the emperor. But there's also an empress. Why do I have to count on her? Coordinate my decisions? Share? Thought the emperor of Thanatos Guiotti. Natasha threw more and more arguments at him, provoking his irritation, anger, aggression against the empress. She also suggested ways how exactly to realize their goals. The next time, Natasha told the emperor that she would take it upon herself to destroy the empress's brother. I will make it so that in a few months, everyone around her will. Her brother will become a scoundrel, disgraced like the scoundrel who raped the emperor's favorite. The temptress sat in a beguiling pose, holding a glass of wine. Her young, voluptuous, rounded form was almost jutting out. Her silky hair fell over her shoulders, almost to the floor. Her smile was captivating. The emperor was completely at her mercy. Natasha began to caress the emperor. Her caresses went on and on, becoming more and more excited and frank. At the same time, the cunning woman continued to suggest to her crowned lover what he should do to get rid of his wife. The emperor gasped and groaned more and more. His treacherous mistress said that the empress would do all she could to save her brother. But the more she worked to free him, the more it would look like she was just trying to protect him. This will damage her reputation and cause frustration and distrust among those around her. We will arrange for compelling and very unpleasant evidence to be found in her brother's room that will defame the Empress, she explained her plan. And everything will be presented in such a way that everyone will believe that this is Rosalind's nefarious trickery and that she is doing it out of hatred for you and for me, your favorite. Then, pausing in her caresses at the most piquant spot, the cunning schemer said that before all this, the Emperor had one more thing to do. She continued the caresses again, already on her knees. 
Then she saddled the man like a stallion and said that it was necessary to bind the empress's hands so that she would be deprived of everything. Thus, Natasha led the emperor, telling him that it was necessary to get rid of all the empress's close relatives and friends so that she would be left in complete solitude without all those who were dear to her, without support and encouragement. And then Natasha thought that was all well and good. But at the upcoming reception, Empress Rosalind would once again be face to face with his imperial majesty. This did not suit her at all. And as she continued to please the emperor, she began to think of ways to ensure that Rosalind would not be allowed to attend palace ceremonies from now on. Then at the reception, in the presence of all the dignitaries, I will say that I am carrying your majesty's child, and that will be Rosalind's last appearance as empress, Natasha told her. For thanks to her brother the beast and her own jealousy, she will be exposed as a terrible woman who made an attempt on the emperor's family. Oh, this is all turning out so well, don't you think so? She invited the emperor to rejoice at her discovery. Natasha continued to influence the emperor with the most active and sophisticated intimate caresses, bringing him to complete ecstasy and full consent to her. The empress's lovers and family will surely try to protect her, but this is a good time to accomplish our goals, she said. Your majesty, the time has come to draw the sword and put an end to all who stand in our way. We must do it in such a way that the empress has no chance to survive. So Natasha concluded her plans about the emperor, who was exhausted from passionate games. But no, she went on, looking at him with a mad look. Fill everything with blood. As clever as the empress is, the death of everyone close to her is exactly the step that will help break her. The empress walks through the palace of the empire of ice and gold. She treads on a wide carpet, but her gait is uneven. She is accompanied at a respectful distance by a handmaiden. This is the 17th empress of Thanatos. In her hand, we see the cane on which the empress leans while walking. Yes, she is limping on one leg. Rosalind v. Sunset. She is popularly regarded as the most beautiful, honest, noble, and perfect ruler in the history of the empire. This young woman has proven to be an outstanding politician and an excellent diplomat who speaks six languages. Rosalind has always been kind, just, and generous. She helped the poor. Through her efforts, a medical facility was established. And she not only contributed financially, but she also visited the sick personally, not considering it beneath her dignity and position. Rosalind listened to the suffering, sympathized with them, provided material and moral support. She was called the Empress with a big heart. That is what she really was. Therefore, even because of such a handicap as a limp, it never occurred to anyone to point a finger at her, to mock her, to disrespect her, to ridicule her, or to make fun of her. Ice Rosalind was loved and honored by everyone, except Emperor Guillotti himself. It had been many years since they had been married. But for the most part, that marriage had been a spectacle only to those around them. And now the emperor and his vengeful minion have decided to get rid of it. And they've already put some of their plans into action. 55, how dare he get rid of all my people? Rosalind could not comprehend such treachery, perfidy, and insolence in the emperor's actions. Even my brother is imprisoned. Oh, Guillotti, fool, blinded by envy and malice. But as long as I have someone to protect, I must hold on and overcome. This was Rosalind's thought as she approached the reception hall for foreign delegations. Poor thing, she felt for Anna, who was a maid of honor and an old friend and confidant of the empress. But she knew that Rosalind was brave and steadfast. The maid of honor remembered how she had run to the empress's chambers, very worried about her health, when she learned that the emperor had severely injured her leg, how she worried and inquired of the empress about the health and condition of her leg. Nothing I'll live, Rosalind replied with a smile. Just that and nothing more. There were no complaints or lamentations. That was her answer. Although for a young, beautiful woman, an empress who was always in full view of her subjects and the representatives of other states. The injury that led to the limp was quite a hardship, not only physically, but also mentally. It seems that your honesty, nobility, and decency will ruin you, Rosalind. The empress stopped at the entrance to the reception hall. Music was playing from there. Why am I not here? I am the empress. Rosalind had been tuning in for some time, mentally preparing herself for the fact that she had to go in there. Your majesty, a maid of honor called to her. Him. The empress turned her head slightly. She looked at her only with sympathy, understanding, and support. It's all right, turned to her and smiled at Rosalind. Will you open the door? I will be at your side, your majesty, to the very end. Very emotionally, she supported her maid of honor. She knew how difficult things were for her mistress, and that she didn't even have anyone to lean on. Anne, the empress responded sincerely and gratefully. A series of illnesses, coincidences, and the machinations of evildoers have robbed me of my closest friends. Rosalind lowered her head at the thought. Lady Charlotte, my beautiful and wonderful maid, 
my loyal supporter, the Home Secretary, and even my faithful protector, the Commander of the Knights. Where are they? Their deaths are the work of Emperor Guillotti. Anna is the last person who remains with me. I can't lose you too, the Empress thought. And out loud, Rosalind told Anna that if anything happened, to leave immediately, and as far away from here as possible, and that she had already prepared the maid of honor for such an emergency. They are at Noam's beach house. Your Majesty, don't say that, cried the maid of honor. How can I, how can I? She was very excited and distressed. Her fingers involuntarily rubbing her skirt clenched into fists in indignation and pain. How can I leave you, Rosie? She said, bowing deeply before the Empress and her longtime friend. Rosie! The Empress smiled. It had been a long time since I had heard myself addressed like that. The words made her feel very warm and comfortable. Just wait a few days, the lady-in-waiting begged and tried to persuade her mistress. The Count of Sorrento is already gathering his forces. And as for the Sunset family, but she had no time to finish her sentence. Anna, Rosalind interrupted her, and it was clear that she had already made up her mind. Open the door, the Empress said. Despair and tears appeared on Anna's face, but she no longer dared to object. The maid of honor bowed and opened the door to the reception hall for the Empress. Her Majesty the Empress has arrived. Rosalind entered the hall and walked across the carpeted floor to the center. The guests present bowed at her sight. The Empress, the Empress has arrived. A buzz of voices filled the hall. Rosalind appeared before the Emperor, who was seated on the throne. She came on her lame legs after all, he thought. Disgusting woman. He was extremely unhappy with her appearance at the reception. Rosalind stood with her eyes slightly downcast. She was beautiful. There was no guilt behind her. She knew her worth and her right and duty to be at the Emperor's side at a government reception. He too was handsome, but anger, envy, lechery, and the ability to destroy others for his own gain distorted his features. Emperor Guillotti and Empress Rosalind looked at each other. Why did you come to the banquet with a sore leg? He exclaimed. But it was not concern for his wife or sympathy. It was resentment and anger, not wanting to see her. Yes, I have a limp, but I continue to walk, Your Majesty, the Empress replied with dignity. Which? His face contorted into a grimace of hatred, his lips curled up to reveal a bestial grin. The presence of the Empress could not help but attract the attention and awe of the guests. They exchanged impressions and emotions. General Taman Krasis, foreign minister of the state of Amor, and Lonasso, ambassador of the same country, were among them. Indeed, she had come after all. The general even bent down a little to get a better look at the royal personage with whom he had business dealings and who was always admired for her intelligence and political skills. The dialogue between the imperial personalities continued. Even if I stumble, I walk in the right direction. I always check and plan my course carefully so as not to lose my way, your majesty told Rosalind, looking expressively into his eyes. A grimace of anger and hatred distorted the emperor's face beyond recognition. He had no words to answer this wise and proud woman. His face darkened, his grin terrible. Well, if she must perish, she must perish alone, Rosalind thought at that time. She was determined to endure it all. To protect her father and mother, it went through her mind, and also to save the treasure of our Sunset family, handed down from generation to generation. Your Majesty the Empress. Suddenly, the Emperor's favorite Natasha walked up to her. She covered her face with a fan. Natasha Rowanti? Rosaline looked back in disgust. What was she doing here? The banquet was for representatives of seven countries, and no one but the government and high state officials could be there. But Natasha was determined to use the reception for her own insidious purposes. And so she set out to carry out her plan. I will accept whatever punishment you give me, she said. Why have you come? asked the Empress angrily. I am so guilty, your majesty, Natasha replied insolently. I shouldn't have said that I was carrying the Emperor's child. Then your brother wouldn't have hurt me and put me in the dungeon she said in a deliberately loud voice so that all present could hear. A buzz of voices filled the banquet hall. Natasha's statement had caused quite a stir. What? What did she say? Did you hear that? The Emperor's child. Everything went black in Rosalind's eyes. It is all my fault, the Emperor's mistress continued, moving closer and closer to the Empress until she was standing right next to her. So please, she began. But without finishing her sentence, she intercepted Rosalind's hand, causing her to let go of the crutch she was leaning on. Please! And Natasha, with a venomous smile, thrust a bloody short dagger into the Empress's hand. Then she raised that hand for all to see. And immediately, with a cry, she fell to the ground before the Empress, spilling the blood she had prepared. And Rosalind stood in the middle of the reception hall, bewildered and confused, with the bloody dagger in her hand. She had no time to react in any way and did not understand what had happened. Natasha was lying at the feet of the Empress. From the outside, it looked as if the Empress had stabbed the Emperor's mistress, who was carrying his heir, with a dagger. That's what everybody thought. There were screams. Some ran for help, 
others for a doctor. There were screams. Over here, Mrs. Natasha, Mrs. Natasha. Hurry, escort the mistress to safety, shouting all around. Taman Krasis looked on in amazement. There you are, Empress, the emperor gloated. Guards, what are you waiting for? He shouted angrily. Take her weapons now. Arrest the empress immediately. The pretender, unable to contain herself, smiled. Well, that's good. Have a good journey, she thought, pleased that the operation had gone very well and that she had achieved what she wanted. Everything was organized and executed with great skill. Those present at the reception were sure that everything had happened exactly as the intruders had orchestrated and presented it. On the carpet, in a pool of blood, lay the emperor's favorite, the future mother of his heir. The empress was holding a bloody dagger in her hand. The public was shocked by the empress's deed. But General Crasis of Timona, being a politician skilled in such matters, saw and understood what was going on in the palace quite differently. The banquet is canceled, cried the emperor. The look on Taman Crasis's face was one of anger. What a fool, he thought, destroying Thanatos's future with his own hands. The wretched bastard doesn't know or realize what a treasure he has at his side. Funny, Lonasso, standing next to him, assessed the situation. From now on, the Empress Rosalind was declared a criminal in her own country, which she had always served with loyalty and love. Taman Krasis could not imagine that such a thing could ever happen. Lonasso, however, shared his opinion, suggesting that the Empress would surely perish before she even survived this winter. Empress Rosalind was thrown into the dungeon. She was locked in a cage. She was guarded by two guards. Before the Empress was overthrown, she was mutilated by the Emperor's executioners who demanded that she reveal the location of the Sunset family treasures. Various highly sophisticated instruments of torture were used as well as metal rods heated on burning coals. Day after day, Rosalind endured the tortures of hell. Day mingled with night. She did not know how much time had passed in her torment, but knowing the Emperor's purpose, she made no sound. Meanwhile, rumors of what had happened to the Empress reached the people, who loved and revered this wise woman with a big heart and a productive politician who strengthened their country. The people came to the capital to rescue Rosalind. Your Majesty the Emperor, we beg you not to kill Her Majesty the Empress, cried the people gathered beneath the palace walls. We beg you, just once, just once, show us your mercy. Your Majesty, Your Majesty. They raised their hands in supplication and entreaty. The Emperor was angry. I thought they would calm down in a few days, but there seems to be no end to the strike. If it dies by my hand, it will certainly arouse the indignation of the people. All my attempts to break it have failed. The executioners have never been able to get the information I want. The use of the most sophisticated torture did not help. All tortures and torments did not yield results. So something had to be done. And the emperor went down to the dungeon where Rosalind had been all these days in solitude and terrible suffering. Well, well, I could learn nothing from you, said Guillotti, looking at the young woman who was emaciated and mutilated at his command. Rosalind chained only raised her haggard eyes to him in silence. You are indeed the empress of the Ice Kingdom. Even after so much torture, you still haven't told me where your Sunset family's treasure is. I want to tear you to pieces and kill you, but your majesty, have mercy, cried out from the street. As you can see, it's very noisy outside, he said. Your majesty, have mercy, save the empress, shouted, begged, and demanded the people standing at the palace walls. I will have mercy on you, so be grateful to me. With a smile, he announced his forced decision, and then he called out, Hey, you, throw this woman into the icy mountains of Krolturia, he ordered the guards. Oh, yes. I almost forgot to tell you, I have a present for you. He went on with special pleasure and cynicism. The girl raised her head and looked at him, not knowing what else she could expect from this monster. What she saw shocked her. It was beyond her strength. Rosalind, who had bravely endured so much abuse and the most painful tortures, cried out terribly and sharply from the tremendous pain, despair, and helplessness that overcame her. She fell to the ground, unable to stand on her trembling legs. The severed heads of her parents were thrown in front of her. Father, mother, her cry was heartbreaking. How could you? The emperor was truly sadistically satisfied at this time. He smiled with a strange sense of pleasure. Oh, do you know how to make such an expression? How pleasant, empress, he gloated. Never, never, I will never forgive you, cried Rosaline in unspeakable grief and despair. She had no strength to bear such pain. Taman Krasis, sitting on his horse, gazed from afar at the imperial palace of Thanatos. So good to be back, he thought after hearing the news of what had happened. So Empress Rosalind V. Sunset has been overthrown, and that's all, but she's alive. And that's the important thing, he thought. For some reason, all these events are making me feel an anger I have never felt before. What's the reason? I don't know yet, but I'm sure of one thing. One day I will definitely destroy this luxurious imperial palace with my own hands. The general thought with all his passion, military strength, and energy. 
What are you looking at? Asked, accompanied by his friend and associate Lonasso. Thanatos's castle? Taman was silent. Ah, I see, grinned Lonasso, having realized something. I wonder what's going on there now. It is rumored that the deposed empress was thrown into the icy mountains of Krolturia. What a pity, said Lonasso. Taman Crassus, hearing the news, was silent. And he himself thought that this woman, the empress, was 171. Stronger, more beautiful, and sadder than any woman he had ever known. And then a thought came to him. He pulled sharply on the reins. He spurred his horse and galloped away. Hey, Taman, his companion called to him. Where are you going? But Taman neither heard nor answered. He ran at full speed. His face was stern. What if she was still alive? If only he could make it. If only he could make it. His mind raced. The Empress at this time, lying alone in the snow among firs and rocks. Am I going to die like this? She thought. Ah, oh, that damned Emperor Guillotti. What has he done? Forgive me, Charlotte, brother, father, mother. I failed to protect you, she thought coldly. The people who were there for me are all dead. I only wanted to make things right. Her hands were already stiff. I wanted to be a good Empress. Why did it turn out like this? She looked up at the cold, indifferent sky and at the tops of the silent cliffs. The blizzard continued to rage. Well, nothing, I'll join you soon, she thought, and turned to the dead people she cared about. The rider slowed his horse. He seemed to have reached his destination. On the snow not far from him lay the body of a young woman. There she is. I managed to find her after all. Taman Crassus has dismounted. He approached his almost icy find. Incredible, he said. Even on her deathbed she lies as if this snowy field and everything around her belonged to her. What a woman! It is so like you, Empress, he thought bitterly. The man bent over her with a feeling of acute pain and sorrow. Why, why, he clenched his teeth, why? Why was she born in Thanatos? Why was she destined to be with that vile bastard? Why didn't I find this woman first, he continued to grieve. But then the unthinkable happened. The girl opened her eyes slightly and looked at him from under her icy lashes. Oh my God, she's still alive! Thanatos rather scooped her up and held her gently against him, trying to protect her from the blizzard, trying to warm her up a bit. No, Rosalind, vice son said, I will not let you say goodbye to your life. I will pick you up and take you with me, Empress. He touched her icy lips and revived them with his kiss. You are mine now, Empress. One day, out of curiosity, a deity decided to create man. Joy, anger, sadness, hope, and other emotions jumped into the cauldron with interest. Satisfied with the result, the god decided to show his creation to the chief god. But as soon as he was distracted for a moment, evil fell into the cauldron. Having thus obtained man, he will always be on the edge of good and evil. Giving in to emotion, men attacked each other and made war for no reason. The first death was caused by man. The whole earth was drenched with blood. When the chief god heard of this, he became angry. He tore to pieces the god who had created man and commanded him to deal personally with the reigning chaos, scattering its parts throughout the world. Six of them were placed in different objects. They were absorbed into the sky and time, the sea and the earth, and the remaining particles were put into human bodies in the form of special gifts. They were divided into the gift of enchantment and the gift of foresight, death and life, and this life could be breathed into another by taking a piece of your own life. Taman wrapped the girl in a tulip, placed her in the saddle before him, and spurred the horse. The girl was half asleep, pale and cold as ice. If anyone had told me that I would ever hold this woman in my arms, I would never have believed it. Timon was moved by what had happened. But the deed is done. You must survive. You must survive, he told her again and again. We'll camp here tonight, Lanasso commanded. Warriors and chariots stood around him. It's freezing. How can Thanatos survive in this cold? The warriors setting up the tent speculate. Come on, come on, get a move on, Lanasso urged them. Suddenly, he heard the sound of footsteps, the crunch of snow beneath a man approaching them. It was Taman. Taman, where the hell have you been? He asked his friend and companion. Wait, who did you bring here? Don't tell me you brought a corpse here. He watched in silence as Taman carefully carried his burden. No, is he all right in the head? Lanasso resented Taman's actions. Taman carried his precious burden into one of the tents and laid it down gently, bloody and icy. He looked at this magnificent woman and remembered. He remembered one of their meetings when he and a delegation from Amor had tried to work out one of their goals with the Empress. So you want the island? In exchange for your help against piracy? She declared. But by giving the island to Amor, we would reduce Thanatos's territorial waters by about three kilometers. Besides, there's water in those areas that we're fighting Liger over. Did you think I didn't know that? She asked. But it's only three kilometers. The more contested areas claimed by Liger are separate. That's how Tame and Crassus tried to counter Empress Thanatos's arguments. But if it bothers you so much, you can give up another island that is not part of the disputed territory. He threw out his fishing rod, trying to lure the Empress into a diplomatic trap. And thus he avoided the real goals that were really before him. Goldal Island will do. He finished, 
The empress smiled at his words. So this is what you want, she said. What do you mean? Taman Crassus asked with a smile, trying to allay suspicion. We know that there is a shipwreck near this island, said the empress. It looks like it has something secret and important to you left on it. She smiled. But it is too late. The Sunset family found the ship. Taman was disappointed. His efforts and the multi-pronged plan he had so beautifully devised had been for nothing. Well, I'll give you back everything that was there. Uh, but in return, she paused, silence hanging in the study. In return, you will grant us a trade license for the red cocoons of the Amor silkworm. A deal? That's how a young woman managed to outmaneuver a delegation of seasoned politicians. And the trade license for the cocoons of silkworms grown only in Amor. Taman looked at this woman, the strongest politician, who knew what was going on in and around her state, who skillfully defended her country's interests. And this woman in this state is now in his tent, intelligent, educated, meticulous, and at the same time courageous, brave, and graceful, he thought. Ha! Ah. There was a sudden heavy exhalation and a moan. Taman looked at the woman, who was clearly losing her strength. Ha! Ah. She exhaled heavily again. It seemed as if this exhalation would be her last. So this power wasn't enough, and it fell to her lips again. Diplomatically, you were the enemy I wanted to destroy, he thought. So why me? Without finishing his thought, he pressed his lips to hers again. Why can't I see your agony? He thought as he kissed her. Mmm, the girl moaned, opening her eyes. Taman Krasis? She recognized him. But what is this man doing to me? She pulled sharply away from the man and covered her mouth with her hand. What are you doing? Rosalind cried out in indignation. I'm treating you, Taman replied firmly. So calm down. Take me back to the mountains, she demanded. No, I want you to stay alive, the man replied. She could find nothing to say, not realizing what was happening. But when he took a step toward her, she cried out, Don't come any closer! And she went to strike him. But Taman caught her arm. Then let me die, she said. Taman looked at her cautiously, surprised. He looked at her hand, all bleeding wounds, disfigured by torture, the nails torn out. Even after surviving such a thing, you don't care? The girl tried to understand why he said that. The shame, the insults, the humiliation of torture, the loss of your family, he went on. About not being able to avenge destroyed loved ones? Willing to be exiled from the place to which you have dedicated your life and end it miserably in the icy mountains. He was angry and held her wrist tightly. The girl bit her lip and bowed her head. He was right about something. All right, she finally said. I've always been a headache for you. I suppose you'd like to wring my neck, wouldn't you? Please do. She took his hand with both hands and put it on her throat. Here, she said, smiling. Don't humiliate me anymore. She looked into his eyes. Taman was astonished. Kill me, the deposed empress asked him firmly. Don't humiliate me any further. Just kill me. Putting his hands even tighter around her neck, she asked again. And this woman is the deposed empress of an enemy country. According to her, she was my headache when I looked at her, Taman thought. That thin neck. He held it with both hands and felt its fragility. He realized that with little effort, he could easily twist it and take the life of this former enemy. Before him were eyes in which there was no thirst for life. There was only emptiness, detachment from the world, indifference. Taman thought it was in his power to ensure that those eyes never opened again. But he frowned. His eyes glittered. Tamon remembered what this woman was like. How great and accomplished in politics, in diplomacy. He remembered the situation when she had discovered his cunning plan. Is this what you wanted? And he sat before her like a delinquent boy. He remembered how she'd promised to return everything on the ship. But in return, she bargained for the right for Thanatos to obtain a trade license for the red cocoons of the Amor silkworm. In this way, she masterfully handled the situation, figuring out the enemy's plans. And at the same time, she offered acceptable terms that satisfied the interests of the delegation led by Taman and her country. He remembered her beautiful violet eyes, shining with wisdom and serenity. Now the same woman stood before him, but she was different. She was broken, exhausted, no longer willing to prolong her existence. She had been dealt an irreparable blow and had changed so unrecognizably. The most contradictory thoughts and feelings were fighting inside Taman. No, he said, no. As long as you want to die so much, I won't let you. And he removed his hands from her throat. And then Taman bent down to her feet and kissed her. The emptiness in the girl's eyes was replaced by surprise at not understanding what was happening. She was confused by this turn of events. She hadn't expected anything, but she hadn't expected this. Nor had she expected anything else except her own death. The man, meanwhile, leaned over and continued to kiss her feet. What? What are you doing? She cried out, shrinking away from him. She was surprised and frightened. I told you I would treat you, he said, continuing to kiss all the wounds, the abrasions on her legs, as if healing them with his lips. Don't move, he ordered her. 
I don't want to. Stop, she begged. But Taman continued kissing her slowly but surely moving her to her knees. I was your enemy, so now I will do whatever I want to you. Please stop, the girl begged. You hear me, it's a request, I'm asking you. A request? He interjected. If you want me to stop, he began, but then interrupted himself. No, damn it, this is so unlike you. He was very angry. Fight, Empress, he shouted, holding her ankle with one hand. Are you begging someone? Do not make me laugh, he continued to shout. The girl looked at him in amazement. If there is something you want so much, then fight, fight and get it, he rebuked her harshly. As you did then, he remembered again the negotiations in the palace, her wise and triumphant face. And me, I'm ready to be a loser any number of times, he thought. Don't you dare, don't you dare stalk her with his words. Fight! Don't you know how to do this? Isn't this your way of life? He gripped her hand tightly. He was appealing to her true self. He wanted her to awaken to her true self. Strong, intelligent, proud, brave. The girl's eyes began to make sense. She listened to him. The next morning came. The camp was just beginning to wake up. The sun was very high and not warm at all. The frosty air permeated everything. General Taman threw back the canopy of his tent. Before stepping out, he looked around. His prisoner slept calmly. Her face was peaceful. The sleep was sound, restful. At this time, in the palace of Thanatos, emperor of the ice realm, the emperor is standing in the middle of one of the halls of the palace. He is tense. Even his back betrays his tension, his excitement, his anticipation of the very answer he needs. At a distance from him, one of his courtiers is kneeling. Is she really dead? The emperor asks him over his shoulder. Yes, the man replies. I am sure. But how can you be sure if her body isn't even there? The emperor hesitates, not hiding his concern. But I found traces of blood. She must have been eaten by mountain animals, his faithful servant assured the emperor. These arguments did not inspire the emperor with confidence. His gaze and face expressed coldness, tension. He could not allow himself to breathe a sigh of relief and relax. Well, all right, he continued. And the relic? The courtier tensed, knowing that his answer would bring disgrace upon the lord, and considered how to present this information. He broke into a sweat of fear. We still haven't found it. It seems to have been stolen a long time ago. How? The emperor shouted. Everything around him rumbled and glittered with his fury. The courtier, terrified of his impending punishment, fell to the ground. This cannot be, the emperor continued, for until recently the relic was in the possession of the empress. Search all places associated with her majesty, find the relic, and bring it to me. With fury, he concluded, I obey, bowed the courtier who had fallen from grace and turned pale. Praise the son of Thanatos, he said, not daring to raise his eyes from the ground, and retreated hastily out of sight. The emperor was stern and cold, he made no further sound. Only his fists were clenched, expressing his inner anger and tension. Damn, what to do? Left alone, he did not control his emotions. Here the emperor became very pale. He felt very ill. He was bent over, staggering. What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm going to throw up. The power passed from generation to generation. To the heirs of the throne of Thanatos was death. This power passed to the heir as soon as he became emperor. But the power of the force was expressed differently, according to the heir himself. Therefore, the power of the Gyotis was not so great. The power could only be used on humans. For example, one could quietly give a person a plague and let him die in agony. Besides, every time you use the force, there's a big payoff. And Guillotti had just committed a series of brutal murders, wiping out everyone close to the Empress. Now it is time for that very payoff. Moreover, even with such power, he couldn't kill Rosalind. This is because of the marriage ceremony. The fact is that during the vows, according to the established custom, the emperor of Thanatos drops his blood into a glass of holy water and drinks it to the empress. This rite was instituted in order that the spouses might not, in spite of everything, turn against each other. So Guillotti tried to kill Rosalind in another way. But the family jewel of the Sunset family, the reliquary necklace that the empress always wore, protected her. So Guillotti failed each time. The emperor staggered and writhed in pain, kneeling on the carpet. At last! Suddenly he cried out with joy and laughed. Ha 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 His face was distorted with a devilish grimace. The look expressed madness. His mouth was set in a wild, obscene smile. Then he laughed wildly. Ho, 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 ho. It was as if he saw what no one else could see. You did it! It serves you right, cried the emperor. Were you the one who excelled? Ah ha 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 ha. Ha 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 ha. And now what? Look now, you're dead. He straightened up, spread his arms, and shouted these words joyfully, looking somewhere in space. You should have known your place. He laughed so hard that the portraits of the imperial family wobbled on the walls. 
One of the portraits broke off and almost hit the emperor, hitting him right on the head. So he could only quack. The emperor sat on the floor and cried. What happened? What happened, your majesty? The servants rushed in, frightened by the noise. Are you all right? What is it? The emperor was sitting on the floor. The back of the portrait was upside down. They were surrounded by the anxious, screaming inhabitants of the palace. What is it, your majesty? Nothing much. Help me up, replied the man. And one more thing. Throw away that damn portrait, he ordered. The maids immediately picked up the portrait and took it out of the emperor's sight. Guillotti was furious. His face twisted with rage. All emotions poured out now, though he remained silent. His gaze fell on the portrait of the empress hanging in front of him. He looked at her, her regal bearing, the calm gaze of her wise eyes. And there was no limit to his hatred. His eyes turned white as if they had faded. Yoo-hoo! He drew his sword and began to strike the portrait of the empress from top to bottom, length and breadth. Die! 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 He shouted with hatred at each blow, and with all his might he slashed and tormented the portrait with his sword. Witch! Die! Please die. Finally exhausted, Guillotti cried out. The servants were shocked by what they saw. And then he hung there, limp with his hands down. His face turned gray. He was exhausted. The sword-torn portrait of the empress hung before him. Rosalind was still looking at it, calm and dignified. Ah, ha, ah, ha, ah, ah, ah. Throwing his weapon to the floor, the emperor fell to his knees, clutching his head with his hands and shouting loudly. The servants were frightened and depressed, not knowing how to help their master. Such were the events that took place in the palace of the emperor Thanatos. The sun was at its zenith. The barkens of the sands were motionless. All around was a yellow-orange hue. General Tam and Krasis's detachment was returning home with the red flag held high. Three mounted riders escorted Taman, who stood in the center of this triangle. In front of him in the saddle, he carefully held his prisoner, wrapped in snow-white robes so that her face could not be seen. Only a silhouette could reveal the slender female figure. The warriors on foot moved behind them. The heat was incredible. The sun blinded the eyes. The sand was heated. All the warriors wore white robes, cloaks, or bushes to protect themselves from the burning rays of the scorching sun. Rosalind sweltered in the heat. And Taman's heated body, with which her back was in contact, added to the girl's discomfort. It was very hard for her, the ice empress of an ice land, to be in such a climate. Oh, I'd rather freeze in the snow, she thought exhausted. By the way, how long have I been with him? A thought crossed her mind. She remembered her nights, when he had breathed strength, energy, life itself into her. My hands, she raised them in front of her. She examined them carefully. They were almost healed, even without ointments. Maybe she was dreaming. Perhaps it was all about him. She looked at Taman's calm, masculine, confident face. No nonsense, she pulled back. In the last 100 years, the fifth fragment never appeared, so this man can't be mine, she thought. But then why did I recover so quickly? How do you feel? Taman asked thoughtfully, looking into her face and interrupting her thoughts. Rosalind listened to her feelings. You may have saved me, but I could die at any moment, she replied. Taman listened with surprise to his companion's reply. What nonsense, he smiled, putting his arm around the girl and looking into her eyes. I will save you as many times as it takes, he assured her. Rosalind heard him, but she looked away and was silent. The walls of the palace appeared before them. Here we are, General Taman Krasis announced their arrival. This is my land, he said, leaning towards the girl. It was the palace of the Kingdom of Amor. Not only the unusual nature, but also the peculiarity of the buildings opened before the eyes of the traveling empress. A peculiar culture, different from those she was familiar with. At the gate that opened, the newcomers were enthusiastically greeted by a crowd of residents. The delegation has returned, they shouted. Shouts of welcome flew from all directions. Taman, great Taman, long live Taman. Everyone was there from the smallest to the largest, men, women, and children. They raised their hands in the air in greeting and joy, cheering and honoring those who had arrived. Looking at Rosalind, Taman noticed that she was uncomfortable. The girl wrinkled her nose. She had not fully recovered. The heat, the long journey, the shouting of the crowd made her feel uncomfortable, weak, insecure. Lanasso, Taman called to his faithful companion. Yes, asked the latter. Some urgent business has arisen. I'll go first. Please submit all reports yourself. What? That one screamed. Eh? Where are you going? But Taman clicked his tongue, spurred his horse, and sped away at full speed. After a while, they came to a halt near the walls of Taman's domain. Good heavens, General, Rosalind heard the lively exclamations. She looked out from under the blanket. A man and a woman were running towards her, smiling happily. In the distance, a line of young girls stood with folded arms. Have you decided to come here right away? Asked the faithful servant. Boys, take care of the master, he ordered. Taman brought the girl into his house. 
They dismounted and he took the girl in his arms and carried her into the house. Whom are you holding in your arms? Asked those who met him. Taman made no comment. Have you prepared the water? He asked. Hey, yes, of course it's ready, replied the servant. They entered a bright room decorated with columns, moldings, and garlands of lamps on the walls. Come in, a servant bade them enter. They opened the door to the room from which the steam came. No one is to come in here from now on. Taman ordered and brought the girl in. The door closed behind them. They were in a spacious room. Taman stopped at the ornately patterned parapet, right at the edge of the huge pool. Above them hung a beautiful heavy chandelier with candle lights. Taman laid the girl down beside the pool. He undressed himself, girded himself with a blanket below his waist, unwrapped the blanket the girl was wrapped in, examined her, touched the once wounded hands, noticed that the wounds had healed. He lifted the girl, weakened by the long journey, the new climate, and the heat into his arms. She was almost unconscious and stepped into the water. The girl cried out, she's awake, Taman noticed. Oh, where are we? Eyes wide open, she screamed. You are in my house, in the bathroom, in your private bathroom, she asked again. I'd heard that Amor liked to take baths because of the heat, but for people who weren't nobles to afford such a large room. I couldn't even imagine it. She was impressed. The girl began to look around. She saw racks of towels and blankets. Above them at the very top was a fixture with hooks on which hung a bedspread, a chiton, and what is this? She looked closer. It was a dagger for self-defense. What are you looking at so closely? Taman asked, noticing that the girl was very interested in something. Taman, you made the wrong decision to save me, she said, stepping away from the man. Taman looked at them, trying to figure out what was going on. I decide what's right, he said, leaning over her. What's wrong, he asked. Rosalind drew away from him again. Impertinent, she said. She looked at him with a smile and a squint. So what? Impudence is inherent in everyone, he replied smugly, smiling too. And what is your goal, she asked, moving further and further away from him. Destination, he asked again. He looked at her as if he saw her again. The girl had regained her former beauty. Her pale porcelain face was set off by her beautiful violet eyes. Her silver hair cascaded down her shoulders. He lowered his gaze. A buxom breast swayed before him. He noticed a drop of water dripping from it. The man was embarrassed and fascinated by her feminine beauty and form. I never thought Taman could be embarrassed by the sight of a woman, she said, taking another step back. Neither did I. I had no idea, he smiled sheepishly. I could never have imagined that I would be so passionately attracted to the Empress of the Bend, he said quietly. If you want a woman, find another, Rosalind said firmly. There must be many such willing men. You bet, he smiled proudly and confidently, but kindly at the same time. All of them, however, are not you. You talk as if you want only me. She continued to back away, one step at a time. That's right, it's you I want. Nonsense. The girl had already climbed the parapet. I've got nothing. You're wrong. You have a lot. He looked at her earnestly and spoke with conviction. You have your experience, your mind, your body. Rosalind was already approaching the coveted object for which she had distracted Taman with conversation. And your heart, the man continued, listing the girl's virtues. And I want it all. He put his hand to his breast. In that case, I'm really sorry, she said. In one leap, she was near the dagger she so desired and snatched it away. I have nothing to give you, she repeated and quickly slashed her throat. Taman had no time to react to such an unexpected turn of events. Blood splattered on the marble floor of the monogrammed room. What on earth was that? Taman was shocked and incredibly angry. A bloody dagger lay on the floor. A man ran to the wounded woman. Who the hell is this woman? How much effort and time had been spent to save her, and she was at it again. Strange Rosalind's mind was racing at this time. How strange. She was half asleep. Taman put his lips to the wound, trying to stop the bleeding. Someone wanted to kill me as quickly and brutally as possible. And someone to save me. She groaned. Well, thank God the wound is shallow, Taman thought, stopping the bleeding. He's definitely mad, Rosalind thought. How dare you die in front of me again? Taman screamed. You left yourself to your fate, and I picked you up. I saved you by giving up my life force. That's why I hold you so securely and so desperately in my arms. He pressed her gently to him. So, you know, he continued to convey his pain to her. You are mine now. He held her tightly and yet very gently in his arms. Lonasso Paswell? A bright, red-haired, colorfully dressed young woman called cheerfully to Taman's companion and walked purposefully toward him. Uh, I've got you. Lanasso was clearly not happy about the encounter. It was Theorancha Rantif. Queen of Amor. Why don't you go to the royal palace and just stand there? Taman, you asshole, why did you leave everything to me and then disappear? Lanasso thought. Do you ignore my words? The queen changed her tone. She was already angry, and Lonasso did not know what to do, what to say, how to act. By no means, your majesty, did he take a step toward her. 
Thanks to your majesty's care, we have returned safely. He approached her and bowed. The queen immediately cooled down, softened. I knew you were on your way, but I didn't think you would return today. Oh, yes. Where's Taman? she remembered. I see. Hey, well, that. The general's friend and companion didn't know what to say. He was probably angry about Emperor Thanatos and got sick. He found an answer. What? He's sick? The queen was worried. Taman couldn't show this to his subordinates, because it might undermine their morale. So he told only me and quietly retreated to his domain. He continued to dodge and cover for his friend Lonasso. And that, really? The queen laughed. When you see the Thanatos Emperor, even a disease you never had can appear. For this species is disgustingly evil. She shared her impressions. Hmm. But I'm very worried. I mean, this is the first time his illness has shown itself. She went on. And so they talked in the courtyard. I must go to him at once and find out what is wrong with him. Your Majesty frightened Lonasso not knowing how to divert the queen from such plans of hers and prevent her from learning the true cause of Taman's absence. Can't we do this later? Can't you greet me first? He thought of a way out. You heard about what the Thanatos Emperor did this time, didn't you? Wouldn't you like to know the details? Trying to appear nonchalant, he continued. Well, you've managed to intrigue me, the queen smiled. Then let us first have a banquet in honor of the return of our delegation, she announced her decision. Greetings, gentlemen. Ooh, 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 ooh. Lanasso was relieved. He had managed to divert the queen's attention from Taman to other events and faces. Then he got into the saddle and led a troop of messengers and warriors on their way to the palace. The horsemen and foot soldiers entered the walls of the palace of the kingdom of Amor. Messenger! Lanasa was called by a beautiful girl who approached him. Please follow me from now on and led him in a direction different from the course of the rest of the warriors. We are back in the pool where our couple is. Taman brought his lips to Rosalind's and kissed her. Is this really how he treats me? Such thoughts passed through the girl's mind. That's enough! That's enough. She pushed him away with the palm of her hand in her chest. That's enough. She listened to her sensations. Taman looked at her. But I feel completely healthy. The girl confessed embarrassedly. What shall we do now? He laughed. Do you regret not being able to die? Rosalind did not find anything to say at once. And don't look at me so angrily. He went on. That look in your eyes, that look in your eyes. It's all ice and emptiness. But I'll make it hot. I'll make you want to live. Taman thought as she looked at the cold, desperate girl. Rosalind thought of the memories of how Guillotti, Emperor of Thanatos, had once taunted her. What is this place where I sleep? Is it a conjugal chamber or a cold stable outside? Instead of embracing the Empress, it looks like it would be warmer to sleep with an ice doll. Everyone laughed. His majesty is good. Any man would grow cold before this woman. She heard the laughter of the onlookers. And this, such a different attitude of the two men toward her, puzzled the girl. Leave me alone, Taman, she said. And if I don't want to, he replied. Do I look like a man who will obey another's orders? Yes, I left myself to die and you picked me up. But what do you think can come of it? Whether I live or die, I'll decide for myself. Yes, that's right. That's definitely you, not the one waiting to die. Forgetting all and falling into despair. This you is a hundred times more beautiful. Hmm, Taman exhaled. This you makes me impatient. He took the girl by the chin. Stop it! Enraged, she slapped him in the face. Taman was stunned by the surprise. And don't you dare touch me again. Don't you dare touch my lips in any way. She declared coldly, sharply, and resolutely. Taman was astonished. I will do it, I promise. She finally heard the answer. If you don't like it, I won't do it anymore. I won't touch your lips in any way, I swear it. Tell me, didn't you hate me? Rosalind continued. Then why do you continue to torture me? Why don't you let me die? It must be in your interest. You're wrong. I've never hated you, Taman told her. Irritation, resentment, anger, yes. But hatred, no. There was a question in the girl's eyes. In any case, he went on. For it was I who saved you by sharing a part of my life with you. But I didn't ask you for that. The girl parried. She stubbornly refused to acknowledge his good intentions. I have no reason to live, she declared. Rosalind was very angry. Well, if there's no reason to live, then the only thing to do is to find one. Isn't that right? Taman said. What possible reasons could there be for me to live? Rosalind wondered. Hate? Revenge? The collapse of Thanatos? But no, such things do not interest me. Well, Taman continued. What about love then? He asked, looking into her eyes. The girl looked at him in surprise and confusion. You have a pretty face now. Taman laughed. It seems my words have shocked you. Ah, ha, 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 he continued to laugh. Night came. The girl lay in bed, but she couldn't sleep. But how tired I am today, she thought. And then she heard shouts, cries, noise, and stamping coming from the street. It was a herd of buffalo rushing in. The mighty red-haired beasts came straight at her. Their eyes burned with fire and fury. From the tip of their noses to their foreheads and down their spines to the tip of their tails, 
They had metal spikes of various sizes. The palace guards, armed with spears and covered with armor, tried to block the path of the angry animals to resist them. But they're getting bigger and bigger. Oh shit, they're coming from a crack in the sky, screaming. The buffaloes charged with great force and speed and inexorably approached the building where Rosalind was. One of them succeeded in breaking into the orphanage building. Hurry up, shouted the guards of the emperor and empress danger. Yes, Emperor Guillotti and Empress Rosalind were in the orphanage building at that time, among the children they had come to visit. All were very frightened by what was happening. Your majesty, I'm afraid, cried the boy, turning to Rosalind. It's all right, I'll protect you, she reassured him. How marvelous, she thought, that this crack should appear just when the imperial family was visiting the orphanage. Suddenly, the wall collapsed and Rosalind saw a buffalo charging straight at her. She wrapped her arms around the boy who was tucked into her chest. Other children surrounded her and clung to her for protection. I wonder if any of us will be alive when the guards arrive, she thought. The emperor drew his sword from its sheath. The buffalo's eyes burned with fire. The very sight of it inspired terror. Don't worry, Empress, Emperor Guillotti reassured her and the children. I know how to wield a sword. I can do nothing with this animal, he said, standing boldly before the buffalo and holding out his sword. Here, take this. And he struck with his double-edged weapon. The buffalo roared deafeningly. His open mouth was green, which made his appearance even more terrifying. The empress and the children cried out in fear. What will happen now, thought everyone. The woman resolutely covered the boy with her body to protect him from the beast that was charging at them. And at the same time, she felt a great pain in her leg. The empress cried out for the terrible pain that struck her. Then she stopped herself. No, one must not cry out. The beast is sensitive to sound, so she must be silent. She decided and, barely controlling herself, covered her mouth with her hand. Hey you, I'm not finished yet, shouted the emperor and tried to hit the animal again. I'll show you what I mean, he cried, but he had no time to finish the sentence. The buffalo kicked him in the chest with its front hooves. The sword fell from his hand. The emperor was knocked down by the animal's blow. Ah, he shouted. To make matters worse, one of the metal spikes flew into his face. The emperor screamed and howled, his face on the ground, my nose. And where are the guards, he cried, this way, now. The buffalo stood before him, staring at him with blood-fired eyes, green foam spurting from its mouth. The emperor's heart sank into his heels, so frightened was he. He sprang to his feet and ran quickly away. The empress and her children, unprotected, sat in the distance. The blood from the girl's wounded leg spread across the floor. The children in the room huddled together. Everything was broken, destroyed. Only the emperor had found a hiding place and stood there, hidden, trying not to make a sound. He did nothing more than watch out of the corner of his eye what was happening, and the children of the orphanage were exposed and defenseless before the buffalo. Is the emperor using us as a shield? Thought the eldest of them. If so, we are in great danger. What are we going to do? Thought the teenager, trying to find a way out of the situation. Then he walked resolutely toward the empress. Surely her majesty would know what to do. But the woman didn't know what to do either. She also thought feverishly, what should I do? Her gaze fell on the sword lying on the ground. A plan of action quickly formed in her mind. Child, can you help me? She turned to the teenager. Yes, he replied firmly. The empress had confidence. Now she knew what to do. Wonderful, she said. If the beast disperses and crashes through the door, we can get out of here. Can you make a loud, loud scream? She turned to the boy. The boy agreed, and they waited for the right moment. At the empress's signal, the youth screamed so loudly that it must have been heard to the heavens, and he ran. The buffalo rushed after him to destroy this irritant. We must hurry, Rosalind thought. She grabbed her sword and held it ready with both hands. The boy kept screaming, the buffalo chasing him. And as soon as the opportunity presented itself, an opportunity not to be missed, she took it. Rosalind's right leg and clothes were covered in blood, and her leg hurt terribly. But the girl overcame the pain and fear, and saving the lives of the children who had trusted her, Rosalind stepped toward the buffalo that had turned its back on her. She swung her sword and holding it with both hands, struck with all her might, driving it into the enraged animal. All around her were silent, sitting in silence with open mouths, waiting for the denouement, not yet knowing how it would end. The emperor too watched the scene without coming out of his hiding place. The older girl calmed the children. The emperor stabbed the buffalo again and it fell down. The blood of the beast splashed in the face of the empress. Its splashes were scattered all over the place. The emperor also put his nose out of hiding and waited to see how it would end. He was very frightened. The children looked at him with scorn. The emperor coughed and cleared his throat. Ia, I am the emperor of this land. My safety is paramount, he shouted. The children looked at him sternly. Why are you staring at me? The emperor continued. Yeah, yeah. Seeking and voicing suitable arguments, he said. And Rosalind said nothing. She stood silent, 
holding in her hand the bloody sword with which she had killed a dangerous animal that had threatened everyone around her. Blood flowed from her badly wounded leg. Victory is won, cried the emperor. At this time, the guards who had arrived completed the destruction of the attacking animals. The danger was over. But the events connected with the attack of the herd of fire-haired buffaloes long heated the minds and nerves of the inhabitants of the palace and of the whole empire of Thanatos. A few days after the buffalo attack on the imperial palace, Rosalind moves around the palace, leaning on a crutch. The trauma suffered by the empress has not been without consequences. Ha 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 ha. A merry laugh is heard somewhere nearby. It is the emperor and his mistress, Natasha, in high spirits, flirting, laughing, having a good time. Your majesty, listening to the stories of the victory over the buffalo, the mistress admires the emperor. And the empress is not at all amused. The pain of the trauma has not yet left her. In addition, the emperor's actions play a special role, adding to her disappointment in him. Rosalind enters the throne room and stands in front of the emperor, her devoted maid of honor, Anna, standing a little apart from her. The empress's gaze was cold. She was lost in her own unhappy thoughts. Nor was she pleased with the emperor's so open relations with his favorite, so much so that she still stood by his side. But the king's mistress looked defiantly, haughtily, mockingly at the empress, feeling her distinct advantage over her. The woman who had been so elegant and majestic now stood leaning on a crutch, and when she walked, she limped badly. This could not fail to please Natasha. You were right, your majesty, she does limp, Natasha said, laughing. They walked around the empress as if she were an empty seat and went to a place only they knew. The emperor sneered at his mistress. Yes, he affirmed, she is now a cripple, but for a cripple she behaves very arrogantly. The couple went away, leaving the empress and her ladies-in-waiting alone. Rosalind opened her eyes. She was still in bed in Taman's domain. What was this, a dream, a memory? The girl crouched in bed, trying to come to her senses, to realize what was happening. No, it wasn't a dream. It was real. Three years had passed since then. I wonder, is the boy okay? She thought, remembering the teenager who had bravely risked himself to help her deal with an angry buffalo. I left him a gift before the last feast, she thought. My gift will surely keep him safe. The girl lowered her feet to the ground. She looked around the room where she was now, and quietly, on tiptoe, looking around, walked toward the exit. Now, she thought, now finally I can die without anyone interrupting me. She went to the doors and opened them. Behind them was what looked like a large balcony or terrace. The girl stepped out as if on the way to her liberation. Her eyes were wide open. She had decided to look at the world for the last time, and this world surprised her and made her stay in it for a while longer. High in the sky was the shining moon, and right in front of Rosaline was a vast expanse of water. The light of the moon and the stars reflected on the surface of the water. She had never seen anything like it in her life. Is this the sea I've only heard about? She thought as she watched the foamy waves come toward her and then quietly recede. So there is such a thing? Not a bad view before I die, she decided. Then she leaned closer to the sea, trying to touch the spray of the splashing waves with her hand. Then she moved her foot over the fence. Thank you for showing me the sea, Taman, she thought, already sitting on the outside of the platform overhanging the water's surface, and tried to climb down. At that moment, someone's strong arms wrapped around her and held her gently. It was Taman, of course. It seems I have to be vigilant now, even when I sleep, he said. Too bad, the girl replied. Taman took her in his arms. I've been thinking, it looks like I should change my promise a bit. The girl was questioningly silent, waiting for an explanation. I will treat you unconditionally if you get hurt or sick. I mean, I will do my best to keep you alive, despite your attempts to die, Taman declared. But there are some problems with healing. You know what I mean, don't you? He asked the girl. But even though you know that, you still do stupid things like that. I wonder if I should assume you want me to. Rosalind even opened her mouth in surprise and indignation. What? You what? She began. If that's the case, you can just tell me in words. And even if you don't try to die, I'll listen to you anytime, Taman continued. Stop talking nonsense, the girl cried. But the man just narrowed his eyes and smiled. Yes, now that you are awake, how about a walk, he suggested. I'm not going, then let me go. But he did his work. He led her to the horse, placed her in the saddle in front of him as usual, and they moved along leisurely. Where are we going, Taman? Rosalind asked anxiously. Well, tell me at least to a good place. Hold on tight, he replied. The girl had nothing to do but to obey. Seeing her healthy, I think my abilities are not so useless, looking at her, Taman thought. He remembered what had happened to him five years ago. At that time, he was burning with fever. His body temperature was very high. The sickness that had been handed down from generation to generation in Taman's family began to afflict him as well. If he happened to come across a branch of a dilapidated manuscript in the family library, he would die without knowing the truth about the disease. 
The fifth piece of power that was considered lost was called life. The reason why no one had ever manifested life since the first manifestation of other powers was that there was no one who could withstand the power of this power. If the accumulated heat is not discharged in a certain period of time, the heart will stop. The way to get rid of this heat was to spit it out or give it to someone. That's what was written in the manuscript. The easy solution was to be with the girls. But Taman didn't want to do that. Eh, the smell of powder. As soon as he caught a whiff of it, he was sickened. And then he ran away. General, the pretty girls called to him. But Taman jumped out into the fresh air and tried to catch his breath. And away he went. What a disgusting smell. After that, he couldn't come to his senses for a long time. But when he looked at the Empress Rosalind, he had a clear picture of her. There was no smell emanating from this woman. What am I thinking about now? He blamed himself at such times. Taman, Taman. Was it as if someone was calling him? Taman Crassus. Hey, what is it? He came back from his thoughts. I said, what is this place? Rosalind addressed him. My private forest. This is exactly what I wanted to show you, the man smiled. He helped the girl down. Hmm, I didn't know you were such a spontaneous person, she thought, leaning on his arm. What exactly did you want to show me? You could hear the interest in her voice. Shall I take your hand? He asked, holding out his palm. I can walk alone, Rosalind replied stubbornly. The ground is slippery, Taman explained. If you fall once, you won't be able to get up again. Yes, just like me. He held her hand and looked into her eyes. He meant that the proverb was quite applicable in a different context. Once you fall in love, you can't get out. Taman took the girl's hand. This way, come here, we're almost there. The man led the girl by the hand in a direction known only to him. Uh, 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 there they are, said Taman. The girl followed him, carefully stepping barefoot on the ground, and froze. Who are they? What is he talking about? And suddenly she saw. Moon butterflies fluttering in the moonlight. The sight delighted her. Her eyes opened wide. The girl had never seen such a sight before. It was rapture and enchantment. She stood looking at this marvelous picture as if hypnotized. They glow and appear when the moon rises, Taman explained. They also can't live in cold environments. That's why you couldn't see them in your country. It is said that they have to survive for 10 months to become what they are now. And then they fly at will for about 10 days, mate for two days. Then three days later, they lay eggs and they die. What a short life they have. Taman and the girl admired the beautiful sight. The girl lifted up her hand as if participating in the flight of butterflies. How wonderful, she exclaimed. It's like the dance of the stars. Do you know why these butterflies give off light? Our hero went on to tell us. Why? The girl listened attentively to her companion. The reason is simple but very important, he explained, to live. They give off light, flap their wings desperately to live. As if to say, I am here, look at me. The girl tried to take in what Taman was telling her. Not everything was clear to her, but they're going to die anyway, she thought. Either they lay eggs or they don't. Well, no, there's a difference. Whether you die by laying eggs or just turn to dust. There's a big difference between these end-of-life options. What is he talking about? Whether you die without having done anything or whether you die leaving something behind. Is that what he means? Oh, how wonderful. Once more, she admired the dance of the moon butterflies. By this time, Lanasa was running at full speed on his horse, spurring him on all the time. Trouble, trouble. There was a pounding in his head. Last night, there was a sumptuous banquet at which all present honored the delegation that had returned from the mission and drank to the glory of Amor. The queen raised her glass in the same manner, but something was evidently troubling her. And so, during the next toast, when Lanasso had already touched his cup, she suddenly said that rumors had reached her that Minister Taman Krasis had brought something from Thanatos. Lanasso jumped at the wine in surprise. What is it? What a hit! What a hit! He wiped his mouth and wondered what to say. I'm very curious, continued the queen. My stomach, Lanasso found it. Your majesty, I have a stomach ache. I'll be gone for a while. He left the table in the banquet. The queen looked at him with a cold look. Obviously, she had some information. And now she considered the information and how to proceed. Lanasso's reaction only confirmed that what she needed to know was being kept from her. Queen Teo already knows something. Damn it, Taman, what was he thinking? The rider slowed down the hot horse. They arrived at Taman's domain. With a quick walk anxious to inform his friend and associate of the impending trouble, Lanasso made his way to the estate. And I said, go away. Oh, Mr. Lanasso, why are you doing this? There were shouts from the corridor. Lanasso stood at the door and tried to go in, but Taman's valet blocked him with his body. This is a very important matter concerning the queen, Lanasso shouted. But the Lord commanded him not to be disturbed in any way, and the valet tried to resist. What can be more important than the queen's business? I am more afraid of my master than of the queen, was the answer. Get out of the way, Lanasso grasped the handle of the door resolutely. Ah, uh, Mr. Lanasso, Taman's servant could no longer resist. It's me, it's me. 
With these cries, the young man who had come to save his friend burst into the room. It turned out to be a bedroom. Before he knew it, a dagger was flying at him. Whoa, a guest replied. Go away, Taman shouted frantically. Lunasa was confused. That's what I thought. This woman is the dead empress of Thanatos. Taman was mad with rage. Seeing as you're here after I threw a dagger at you, you don't seem to care if I pluck out your eye? Taman shouted angrily. I'm going, I'm going, Lunasa retreated quickly. The steward was angry. That's why I didn't let you in. Didn't I tell you not to go in there? I wonder how many knives he has hidden in his bedroom, Lanasso wondered. That sick bastard. Here, take this, Mr. Lanasso. The valet offered him a handkerchief. What do I need it for? You have blood on your cheek, Mr. Lanasso. Damn it, muttered the young man, picking up the handkerchief. His skills at their best, as always. If it weren't for this disease he had discovered five years ago, he would undoubtedly have become a ghost on the battlefield, terrorizing his enemies. Pull yourself together. Lanasso calmed himself. As commander of the First Order of Barnes, I cannot allow him to be considered worse than a sick man. And he remembered. Taman, Teo, and I, the three of us, had been friends since childhood. When we went to school in the royal palace, I used to make fun of him in every way, teasing him, teasing him. I thought it was amusing and funny at that time. When my family fell, accused of treason because we had been friends since childhood, Taman helped me a lot. A servant brought him coffee. Lanasso drank it, and the memories came flooding back. If Taman had not once spared me the stigma of being a traitor, I would have long since been buried in the damp earth with my family. He is a friend of mine who once helped me greatly. I'm alive because of him, so I don't even know if I should obey him now or not. What do you want? Taman's voice could be heard. He came out of the bedroom. What is your business with me? It must be very important to barge into someone's bedroom like this. All right, I'll listen to you. The servant also served coffee to Taman and bowed, feeling a little guilty, waiting for further orders. So what happened that you allowed yourself to enter my bedroom? Having cooled down a little, he began to question the uninvited guest about the reasons for his arrival. I think it's time we had a frank talk, Lanasso began, serious and focused. Taman watched his friend with interest. You brought this woman with you, didn't you? I don't know what you mean. Taman tried to avoid a direct answer. I mean that woman, Lanasso shouted, clenching his fists. Taman looked at him intently and said nothing. Did you see her? He asked after a while. Yes, I saw it, Lanasso shouted angrily, unable to control himself. Even her silver hair color. Taman absorbed the information for a while. In that case, I'll have to tear your eyes out, he said with a squint. Oh, come on, come on, I didn't see anything. Lanasso played along, but then he went on. Are you serious? You can behave like that with me, but not with Her Majesty. Her Majesty? Taman calmed down a bit and started to drink coffee as well. Why do you bring this up all of a sudden? She wondered who you had brought back from Thanatos. Once again, Lanasso spoke emotionally and with great concern. He was trying to convey to his friend the complexity of the situation. It seems that someone has already gotten ahead of us and reported it to Her Majesty, so I'll ask again. Will you tell Her Majesty about this woman? Taman only smiled. No, he said confidently. Rosie, what was that? Who could have called her that? The image of a young girl appeared before Rosalind's eyes. Honestly, I like Kane, she sheepishly confessed. Sit here. She invited Rosie to sit on a blanket spread out on the green grass. There were various sweets on it. I'll make some nice tea. Anna, Rosalind thought. That's Anna, isn't it? My childhood friend who later became a maid of honor at court. Hurry, hurry, she kept calling insistently, pulling at her arm. Rosalind sat down and Anne began to pour tea into her cup. And then Rosalind's face turned gray with horror. Her eyes opened wide. Blood poured into the cup instead of tea, over the rim, right into her hands. Your Majesty, the Empress... Someone called to her again. Rosalind threw the cup to the floor and saw herself in the blood-soaked dungeon. Opposite her sat her favorite maid, chained and covered in blood. Charlotte, Rosalind cried out in horror. Then, as if looking into herself, she saw other images and pictures. Father? Mother? In front of her were the severed heads of her parents. Our dear Rosie, she heard their voices. She covered her mouth in grief to keep from screaming. Your Majesty, you must always be steadfast, she continued to hear the voices. How could it be? Rosalind was horrified and sobbed bitterly, unable to control herself. She was in a dark, bloody room. She was cold, scary, crying. Rosie, she heard her name called again. An older man stood beside her. I should have protected you better. Every harsh word I said upset you, didn't it? Grandfather, she cried. I never wanted to give you to the Imperial family. I was always afraid it would only bring sorrow and suffering, he continued. I'm sorry I left you first, the old man said sadly. No, you're not. Don't blame yourself, Grandfather. It was my choice, Rosalind cried. What a relief that you left first, she said, holding his hands. How your soul would have ached if you had seen the torment I was under. His palms melted in her hands. What is this, Grandfather? She was perplexed. 
For a while, Rosie sat there trying to figure out what was going on and come to her senses. Then the semblance of a smile appeared on her face. It's okay. Rosalind saw herself in a dress with a bloody hem. Her bare feet left bloody footprints. The girl walked to the edge of the cliff. It's all right. I'll see you soon, she said brightly, looking up with a smile, and stepped down and flew into the abyss. She flew down, but it was already met at the bottom. It was Taman's hands, and he caught her, took her in his arms. Then they sat with him on the snowy edge of the forest where she was already icy, ready to go to the next world, and he warmed her with his breath. No matter how many times you try to die, I will save you again and again, she heard him say. Let go, she begged him. I have no more reason to live. If you don't have any, perhaps you need to find some, he asked, smiling. What do you want? Hate? Vengeance? The fall of Thanatos? I don't want that, she rejected him. Then he took a lock of her hair. What about love? He asked, playing lightly with the strand. Love? Me? That did not sit well in Rosalind's mind. Ah, she pronounced. Wake up already? A dark-skinned woman and two teenage girls huddled around her. They were very busy. She herself lay in bed. We were so worried. You were breathing so hard, the woman said, turning to Rosalind, who was crouched in bed, trying to regain consciousness. Are you all right? She asked. Seeing that the mistress had gradually come to her senses, she smiled in greeting. We are a little late with our greetings, she said. I am your maid. My name is Arel. The girls also smiled happily, seeing that all was well, and introduced themselves as well. We're twins, Tasha and Louie. Your hair color is so nice. Rosalind was impressed by the emotions she had experienced and the new experiences she was having. She was shaken and crying, quietly at first, then loudly. Oh, the maid was shocked. The girls couldn't understand what was happening either. Beautiful mistress, why are you crying? Arel tried to calm Rosalind and understand what was happening. The girls, on the other hand, ran out of mistress's bedroom. Master, master, they ran through the corridors of the mansion. Stop, stop. Wait, don't run. Taman, who had come out at the shouting, stopped them. The twins were excited and couldn't catch their breath. Master, something's happened. That woman, that incredibly beautiful woman, that woman. They couldn't catch their breath and calm their emotions. She what? Taman asked. She's crying. She's crying all the time. They were finally able to find out the reason for the commotion. Taman sped off so fast that the girls didn't even have time to yelp. They just looked back at him. Did I get that right? Did one ask the other? Are you sure? The second asked the first. And they both smiled in understanding. Their cunning faces resembled two foxes. Come, let's write everything down, cried one. Oh, I've got goosebumps, cried the other. And they hurried on with their urgent business. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, Arel hugged Rosalind to her chest. It's going to be okay, it's all right, she reassured the young woman. Lersha Lesha, Lersha Lesha, Arel said from time to time. Lersha Lesha, it was familiar to Rosalind. It was her nanny's way of invoking a deity from a sign, a deity she often invoked. That's why the maid looked so much like her. And this woman is also from there. Do your eyes hurt? Can I get you a drink? She addressed the soothed Rosalind with an affectionate and caring smile. They were already sitting opposite each other, a little calmer, when a panting Taman burst into the bedroom. You've come, master, Arel rejoiced. There were still traces of tears on Rosalind's cheeks. She looked at Taman in silence. Then she became embarrassed and turned away slightly. I will go, said the maid, and left delicately. The youths were left alone. Taman looked at the girl questioningly and anxiously, waiting for an explanation. Then he crouched down beside her bed. Then he knelt before the girl. M, she moaned. And he took her in his arms and pressed her close to him. Thus embraced, they sat for some time. What? asked the girl suddenly. What are you doing? she shouted. Let go at once. After all the torture you've endured so steadfastly, what could possibly make you cry? Taman asked. Does it hurt? He looked into her eyes with concern and compassion. Ankles, replied Rosalind, the first thing that came to her mind. So I want to lie down a little longer. Taman looked at her feet. Right ankle then. What, what are you doing? The girl even leaned back a little. Taman kissed her ankle, holding it gently with his hands. For a while, Rosalind just sat there, finding herself in some special new to her sensations of what was happening. Then she looked very attentively at the man who was treating her so carefully. Attentively, attentively, attentively and affectionately. What is it? What's going on? I have no words. There was an outcry. It was Rosalind who remembered how she and the emperor had chosen their shoes in the boutique. The staff would bring out a pair or two. She helped the empress try them on and find a more comfortable pair. Guillaume was outraged. What are you doing with that? It's just a little wound. We're wasting our time in this shop. Aren't you tired of putting shoes on your feet? He was angry. This is ridiculous. You just want to hide your ugly mutilated foot. No silk in the world, no skin in the world can hide this ugliness, he continued to argue. Idiot. What an idiot you are, cried Guillaume. 
Tell me, Rosalind said to Taman, aren't you disgusted at the sight of my foot? Not at all, he replied. It is beautiful, so beautiful that I want to kiss it. Have you really no shame? She asked, smiling slightly. Aha, uh -huh, very much so, replied the young man. He also smiled at her, openly and sincerely. Ha, the girl smiled even more openly. Taman just blinked his eyes. Just talking to you makes me tired, she said, leaning back on the bed. You have no idea how hungry I am, he said. So what shall we eat? He immediately changed the subject. Then he picked her up in his arms and carried her into the living room. What do you want? It happened a few days ago. A carriage drawn by a pair of horses was driving down the road in the dark. The driver was sitting on the wheel. Beside him was a passenger. What? The empress was tortured. What madness. The emperor has gone completely mad. The man who had heard this outrageous news from the coachman could not contain his emotions. Silence, silence, he replied harshly. If anyone hears us, we are in trouble. Who is there to hear? Ah, uh, that frightened little fellow who sits in the cart. Hey, if you try to tell anyone, I'll kill you with my pickaxe. The passenger threatened the boy. Oh, what will happen to the country without Empress Rosalind now, thought the young man. He remembered the role Natasha was now playing in the palace. He also remembered his last meeting with the Empress in the palace on the eve of the banquet. Are you sure? She had asked him then. Yes, please. I would do anything for the Empress, he replied, kneeling down. Rosalind looked at him. In that case, Arsène, she began. The young man was all attention. He was ready to listen to her and to carry out her errand. Will you be able to deliver this to the port city of Livre in the northeast? Asked the empress. In her hand was a precious jewel. When you get there, you will find a merchant named Scarlet Serpent. Try to give this to him before he even crosses the waters of the Talia region. Be aware that the road to Livre is very dangerous, as is the town itself. She warned me. Are you sure? Rosalind asked again. I will certainly grant your wish, your majesty, he exclaimed, looking at his empress faithfully and adoringly. She was satisfied with his reply. Then she laid her hand on his head and silently blessed him. Thank you, said Arsène to the empress. The young man looked at his wrist. It was originally a necklace, but had to be made into a bracelet to be smuggled in without much risk. On his wrist, it wouldn't draw as much attention. It was definitely not just a piece of jewelry. Arsène knew that. So I should definitely give it to that merchant, he thought. Talia is the sea region bordering Livre, and the home of a water creature against which several nations have fought in vain. After the creature was defeated, trade resumed in the city. It remained active for two months. This period was called the month of trade. But it would end very soon, Arson thought. If I speed up, I can get there in ten days. But what if I'm still too late? He didn't want to think about how it would end then. I have no idea when I'll be able to meet this scarlet snake again. I have to make it. I'll make it. Arson cheered himself up and promised himself. Suddenly, the carriage shook so much that he fell down. Why now? Help me. There were shouts. What on earth is going on there? Thought the young man, worried. He shielded himself with his hand from the light that struck his eyes when someone opened the hatch of the wagon. Before him stood three men in black robes and hoods covering their faces. Take him, one of them commanded. Let him go, the young man begged. I belong to the Imperial Academy, he began, but someone behind him gagged him with a handkerchief. Gasping for breath, he could not utter another word. The images of the three attackers became blurred, and blurred like a mist. Our heroes are sitting on a terrace in Taman's domain. They are dining. The vast surface of the sea stretches before them. The golden rays of the sun are reflected in its mirrored surface. The sunset was so beautiful that the girl could not admire the unusual sight. So that's it, the sea, she marveled. Her eyes were calm and bright. A light breeze ruffled Rosalind's silvery hair. She felt this wonderful natural beauty so well that she was completely distracted from her dinner. Admiring the wonderful phenomenon of the sunset and the view of the evening sea, the girl felt good in her heart, calm, light. You seem to like it, Taman remarked, noticing the girl's mood and look. Of course I do, and how could I not, she replied. It's the first time I've seen it, she replied with a smile, admiring the sight before her. Have you never seen the sea? Exactly, she replied. The evening was beautiful. The young couple sat on the terrace and looked into the distance. How did it happen? Taman was surprised. After all, Thanatos is a realm with access to the sea. The girl covered her eyes slightly with her lashes. It's very simple. I could not leave the palace, she replied. Really? Taman could not find the words. So stunned was he by this information. They continued to eat, talking quietly. By the way, Rosalind thought. She stuck her fork into one of the dishes on the table. What is it? A scallop, answered Taman. The girl looked at him with surprise. This dish was unknown to her. It's part of the Cataran shellfish, Taman explained poking the scallop with his fork. It's sliced and eaten raw. But you can cook it. It's quite tasty. Try it, he suggested. And today it is especially tasty. 
Taman put a piece in his mouth with pleasure. The girl listened to him. Then she also ventured to beat the scallop on her fork, took it to her mouth, and tasted it, listening to her sensations of taste. Taman watched with a smile. So they sat and ate and talked. The girl tried new dishes, became acquainted with new tastes. The girl's appearance had changed a lot lately. She had become remarkably more beautiful. Her beautiful silver hair fell beautifully from her shoulders, with strands falling across her forehead. Her violet eyes were alive, empty, and interested. Her finely worked porcelain face was very sweet and delicate. I wonder if Arson got to leave her safely, the girl thought. She was still preoccupied with her former worries. I hope he is well. She lowered her eyes and remembered some events of her life. The waves of the evening sea splashed near the terrace. The girl remembered the first time she had seen the sea. How, on the first night of her stay in Taman's house, she had tried to end her life by stepping into that endless space. How he had put his arms around her and literally held her in the last minute of her life, saving her once again. Lost in her thoughts, Rosalind stopped eating. Taman watching her intently. Your eyes have changed. Do you, what, remember what you wanted to do here a while ago? Well, as things stand, I'm going to ask you something, he continued. Why do you want to die? No one, he heard him answer. I couldn't protect anyone, the girl continued after a pause. Do you think it was your fault? Yes, mine, replied the girl. Taman sat for a while, tapping his finger on the table. How strange. If you were truly sorry, their deaths would not be an excuse for your death. The girl thought for a moment, trying to absorb what the young man had said. Justification? Justification, you say? Suddenly, she jumped up and shouted. Taman continued to argue, trying to make it clear to the girl what her mistake was. Okay, let's say you bear the burden of not protecting her. The girl listened. But who says that the revenge for the deaths of all those people has to be your death? The girl looked at him, eyes wide open. Or do you think those people would want you dead? No, replied Rosalind. They would not have wished it. Yes, let's go on. Such an unjust death. Now you don't think their opinion matters. You're very cruel. No, I'm not, the girl cried out in despair. She literally became a coward. Standing by the table, she bent down. She was overwhelmed with emotion, with nerves. She tried to understand what the man was telling her. He, on the other hand, was calm and doing what he thought was right. He wanted to convey to the girl the wrongness of her reasoning and her desire to end her life at any cost. If it were me, Tamon continued, the girl looked up at him. If it were me, I would die to protect my loved ones. And they would blame me for their deaths, he continued. Rosalind bowed even more under these words, as if they had pressed her. So then even from hell, I would come back to tell them that I was well. And that's why I want you to be okay, too. My death is not your fault, I would say. Rosalind lifted her head and listened carefully to what he said. His words seemed to sink into her soul. And he continued, live, live brightest of all, I would say to them. The girl even ducked under those words. Live the happiest of all. Live! Taman finished his sentence. And with each word, Rosalind bowed deeper and deeper, as if the weight of the words pressed down on her, until she sank to the table, crushed, in despair. We see someone's feet walking on an obscure, unfamiliar, viscous surface. Who is it? It is Giotti the emperor of Thanatos. He looks around, unable to understand what is happening to him. Where am I? He screams. It's sticky in here. It's disgusting. Hey, somebody, he shouts, moving through the blue, viscous, slippery, cold substance, looking around. Is anyone here? He shouts again. He seems to be trying to be pulled into this unknown substance. Suddenly, a wave of purple color almost hits him. Guillotti Thanatos. He hears someone calling his name. He tries to figure out what it is, when suddenly a huge silhouette of a man dressed as an emperor appears in front of him. Giotti recognizes him as his father. Oh, father, he exclaims, stuttering and trembling. Vile insect, sounds the thunderous voice of the former emperor Thanatos. Had I had other children, you would never have ascended to the throne, he says harshly to his son. Giotti falls to all fours in fear and trembling. Pale and trembling, he looked at the ghost of his father, and the latter continued to rebuke his son. Do you have any idea what the Golden Empire is? What was it like to build it? A scum like you became emperor and ruined it. I keep praying and praying. I keep praying that your wife, once the fiancé of the crown prince of the ducal family, will take the throne. That all your affairs will be under her control. That no decision be made at your whim. Do you understand? Giotti continued to kneel in eerie fear, looking up at the enormous size of his father's ghost and listening to what he said. I ask you, do you understand? His father's ghost shouted in a deafening voice, pointing his finger at the kneeling Giotti. You useless idiot! Father Ghost leaned over the trembling, puny body and soul of Giotti. Lucky you to be an emperor worm! He pointed his finger at him like an insect and thundered. Giotti only whimpered on his knees. Then he couldn't stand it any longer and ran away with a loud shriek. 
The emperor was pale as chalk. Saliva dripped from his chin. His eyes were white, frightened. What am I missing? It was going through his mind. What's wrong? He didn't notice that he was in the throne room of his palace. Only this hall was all pink for some reason. In front of him, with his back to him, stood his consort, Empress Rosalind. Guillotti froze. Your Majesty? The Empress noticed his presence and turned her head slightly to look at him. Guillotti was white as chalk. His eyes were full of terror and anger. You, you're already dead, he shrieked and recoiled in fright, seeing her image before him, waving his hands as if trying to erase the vision. All the atrocities committed against me were begun by the Empress. They will be repaid to you in the same measure. Like a sentence, she said. And suddenly, out of nowhere, huge pink butterflies appeared and began to flutter around her as if in some kind of dance. It was amazingly beautiful, unusual, strange, and frightening. Ah, 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 Guillotti screamed. These ghost butterflies flew towards him, landing on his arms, on his body, on his head. He tried to cover himself from them with his hands and shouted loudly in fright. In front of Guillotti was a strange pink-colored throne room, in the center of which, surrounded by a flock of huge pink butterflies circling above her, stood Empress Rosalind, silently and sternly looking at him. Guillotti shouted. He tried to close his eyes so he wouldn't have to see it all. But the Empress continued to stand before him, and the monster butterflies circled. The Emperor groaned, and screaming with fear again, he awoke to his own scream. He crouched down, trying to realize where he was and what was going on, and found that he was in his bedroom. Next to him in bed was his favorite, Natasha. Guillotti woke her with a scream. Your Majesty, what happened? She asked worriedly. Are you having a nightmare? Seeing his confused state, she clarified. The Thanatos Emperor sat up in bed. His eyes were mad. His face expressed intense fear. He was not himself. A tremor shook his body. Empress, that was all he could say. She survived. She's alive. His savage scream filled the bedroom. I can feel it, he screamed in a frenzy. This soulless woman is not dead, he continued to scream. Natasha listened to him, trying to figure out what was wrong with him. My emperor, she spoke, trying to calm him. What are you talking about? She's already dead. I have to make sure of that. Guillotti continued to shout, pulling away from her embrace. This woman is definitely alive, he shouted again, pushing Natasha away. I have to see for myself he shouted. And again, in his frenzy, he pushed Natasha so hard that she fell from the emperor's bed to the floor with a scream. She keeps torturing me, he shouted in a rage and ran out of the bedroom. Your majesty, Natasha called after him, but he did not hear her. The image of the deposed empress Thanatos stood before him. Natasha was left alone in the emperor's bedroom. She was sitting on the carpet, which was lying on the floor where she had fallen after Guillotti's thrust. Oh my, the further you go, the more arbitrary you become, emperor. She was unhappy with what was happening. I thought things would be better once the Empress was gone, Natasha thought. She thought about her own thoughts. Thoughts swirled in her head. It's okay, it's all right. She calmed herself. One day this place will be yours, baby. She addressed the fetus in her womb that she was already looking forward to. Hurry up and give birth and kick your brainless daddy out of here. With a smile, she said dreamily, stroking her rather expressive, protruding belly. And your mother will prepare and do everything necessary for that, Natasha continued gloatingly. Taman's estate, evening. Over the sea again, the picture of a beautiful sunset. Rosalind looking out to sea. The waves gently approach the terrace, then roll back. A couple is sitting at a table. There is a kettle on the table, cups. There is peace and quiet all around. I've got an idea, Rosalind suddenly hears Taman's voice. What? She answers by looking at him. Your new name is spoken by him. New name? Hmm, the girl was surprised. Taman looked at her and thought of his own. Then he brought his hand to her face, gently touching her lovely head. The girl looked at him, eyes slightly open, mouth slightly agape in surprise, waiting to see what he would say. Aaron Roja, Taman said, looking into her eyes. They both listened to the sound of that name. What does it mean? asked the girl. Taman took a lock of her hair and brought it to his lips. I won't tell, he smiled. The girl looked at him questioningly. Suddenly, Taman got up and stretched. It's hot, he said, and I'm tired. I should take a nap. Taman held out his hand to the girl. What does this have to do with me? Rosalind asked. Let's go together, he replied. But I don't want to sleep, she parried with a capricious and irritated intonation. But he took her hand and, with an enigmatic smile, pulled her along. Well, then you lie down and rest, and I'll get some sleep. The girl looked again at the wonderful view of the sea. The sun had already set over the horizon, but its rays colored the clouds in a new pinkish golden palette. To be honest, she started, Taman looked away. I want to see the sea again, Rosalind admitted. 
You should have said so at once, Taman said. He let go of her hand. The girl thought he had gone to meet her. But Taman took her sharply in his arms. Rosalind shrieked in surprise and became angry. Why did you pick me up? She scolded him. It's faster to walk that way, he replied. Where else should I go? Let go! The girl screamed in indignation and kicked. But he held her in his arms and just laughed. Taman Krasis, she called out to him sternly. Sounds good, you can continue, replied the man. I hate you, Rosalind screamed. Nothing. One day you'll scream your love for me, he said. Just thinking about it makes my heart skip a beat. Taman continued up the stairs, carrying the girl in his arms, ignoring her protest. How can you be so insolent? She was indignant. But Taman, not listening, carried his precious burden. Here we are, he said. Where to? The girl was surprised, her eyes wide open. Immediately in front of her was a huge panoramic window, a full wall, overlooking the sea that had so enchanted Rosalind. Near this stained glass window was a bed. Rosalind was so amazed that she could not find words. The seals were quietly warming their backs on the rocks. The waves of the sea were crashing against these rocks. All this came before their eyes, right in their bedchamber. Taman lowered the girl onto the bed. She pulled the blanket to cover her. Now you can look at the sea, lying down right here, Taman said quietly. Only then did Rosalind realize what was happening. She was simply shocked. I'll sleep with my arms around you. And so they lay there. He was resting with his arms around her, and she kept looking at the view before her. The sea lapped at the rocks. A Chinese lantern flew in the sky. Taman slept peacefully behind her. Rosalind looked back. How peacefully he sleeps, she thought. Why should her death be a reason for your death? She remembered his words so sincere and thought-provoking. What is to be done, she thought. It's not your fault. And how those words literally hit her. Live the brightest. Once again, she was reminded of Taman's words. The happiest, live, she looked at Taman again. Because of him, she thought. Because of him, I'm still alive. She wanted to touch him. Rosalind turned to the sleeping man, beautiful, gentle. She looked at him and caressed his face. My thoughts of death are fading, she noted the changes taking place within her. She thought about how much he did for her, which was quite unusual for her. Suddenly she heard Tamon, who had been sleeping so peacefully and quietly, begin to moan and groan in his sleep. Em, what's wrong with him? Rosalind was worried when she saw that he was getting chills. She pulled herself up on the bed and watched him. The man was groaning, cowering. Taman, she called to him, trying to wake him. But he just clenched his teeth, shivering. The girl turned him onto his back. What's the matter with you? Is something hurting you? She asked. But the man was obviously very sick. He was just screaming and clutching his heart with his hand. His body is too hot. What should we do? The girl was worried sick. Taman just grunted and moaned, sweat from the heat on his cheeks and forehead. The girl did not know what to do. Taman, Taman, what's wrong with you? She cried in despair. Taman jumped out of bed. To drown out the agony he felt, he went to the wall and knelt down, banging his head against the wall. The girl stood behind him. Stop it, she shouted. You could die like this. She tried to approach him to help him, but he stopped her with a forbidding gesture of his hand. Stay back, he commanded. Stay there, stay where you are. He literally slumped to the floor in his misery, clawing at the walls of the room with his hands, but did not allow her to approach. He was very sick, barely hanging on. Shit, shit, he screamed and slammed his fist into the wall. The girl stood at a distance, not knowing how to help him. Hmm, Taman keeps grabbing his chest, she noticed. Could it be the disease? In every generation of the Krasis family, there is one person who suffers from this hereditary disease, Rosalind remembered. I've heard the rumors, but I didn't think it was this serious. But something must be done, she thought as she watched Taman's agony continue. The sufferer himself was trying hard not to lose his mind at that time. Otherwise, he would have broken his promise to her. One must hold on, he thought. One must not relax and give free rein to one's desires. Taman remembered that the book said, though not in detail, that if one shared one's life force with a person on the verge of death, one might be in mortal danger to oneself. And what is happening to him now is obviously the opposite side of his power. This is a case where the vital energy can manifest in a negative reaction, he thought. It's been a long time since I've let out the force, so my body temperature has reached its peak, he realized. Shit, what am I going to do? I'm going. Just once, just once, he thought, although it seems that it's possible to spurt more than that. But just once. We should call the servants, Rosalind said sympathetically as she approached Taman. He just looked back at her and remained silent. Don't you? She asked again. So this is all because of your power, since you won't tell me to call others? So the fact that you have the force is a secret, she guessed. Rosalind approached him. Well, if others can't know, she looked at him carefully. Perhaps I can help in some way? 
Taman's eyes went wide. Is that what you really want? He turned to her. Rosalind crouched beside him. Then she knelt and took his hand in hers, looking into his eyes. I will never recant, she replied. And, opening her eyes wide, she froze, waiting for his answer. Taman considered what he should do. Then he made up his mind. He took her face in the palms of his hands. Then he lifted her chin slightly and ran his thumb over her lower lip. Well then, don't complain later. He brought his face close to hers. They stared intently into each other's eyes. Taman, putting his arm around the girl's waist, pulled her close to him and began to kiss her hard on the lips. The moon shone in the starry sky, leaving a path of silvery moonlight on the surface of the sea. The night was replaced by a bright, clear morning. That's enough. I want to sleep, Rosalind pleaded, pushing the insatiable man away from her. Just a little longer, he pleaded, kissing her neck. Please let me sleep a little longer, she pleaded. Yes, I was the one who said I wanted to help. Well, who knew he was such a hot man, the girl mused. He seemed better now, though. Taman was clearly coming back to life. What a relief, she thought. Taman finally gave in to Rosalind's pleas. He covered her with a blanket and left her alone. Aaron Rosia, he said as he looked at her. When I saw you in the distance, I felt cold. But as I drew near, I realized that I was becoming greedy. He touched the hair on her temple gently and tenderly. The girl rested with her eyes closed, covered with a blanket up to her breast. Charming woman, he said, putting his arm around her and resting her head on his shoulder. Any paradise could replace lying like this with you in my arms, Taman marveled. Behind the huge stained glass window, the azure sea splashed. The young lovers lay cuddled, pressed tightly together. It won't work, your majesty. Taman heard a voice at the door. Hmm, your majesty? He woke up. Yes, indeed, the queen of Amor appeared in Taman's domain. A faithful servant doing his duty blocked the door leading to the master's bedroom. He tried to dissuade her from violating the order prescribed by Taman, but the queen was stubborn, determined, and persistent. Be quiet, or I won't consider the fact that you're Taman's servant, she ordered. Stupidity knows no bounds. She was already getting angry, but soon she changed from anger to mercy and revived. Oh, she exclaimed when she saw the owner of the property come out at the noise. Hey, we finally meet you, foreign minister, she turned to Taman. What is this early morning business, your majesty? Taman muttered, displeased and confused by her visit. Morning, it's morning. She coughed demonstratively into her fist. Let's have a look. Since when is three in the afternoon morning? She asked, getting excited again. Wow, that's a long time ago. Taman scratched the back of his head. I wasn't feeling well, so I didn't pay attention to the time. He tried to explain his miscalculation. I see, she smiled. So shall we talk inside? She asked. Where, in my bedroom? Taman tensed. Let's do it in the living room, he suggested to the queen. Are you blocking the path of the empress? That would be decapitation, cried Queen Amora. And she herself tried to understand what was going on and why he was so resistant and even willing to break the rules of palace etiquette. So why have you come here yourself? I was going to the palace today anyway, the man muttered. You woke up at three in the afternoon. Would you have gone to the palace at night? She laughed and put a hand to her ample breasts. Her eyes glittered with devils. Did you even want to visit me? She continued, eager to gather the necessary data to expose him. Taman stubbornly and determinedly blocked the entrance to his bedroom and stood at the door. I won't let you in. Your refusal hurts my heart. She looked at him with undisguised suspicion, crossing her arms over her chest. But what are you hiding there? This is getting out of hand. And it doesn't look like a toy for fun, otherwise you wouldn't hide it like that, she thought. So what is this thing you've brought back from Thanatos? You didn't even come to me with a report after you arrived, she continued listing her complaints. This room contains what you brought back? The conversation was becoming dangerous. Taman decided that something needed to be cleared up. Within is only a miserable, trembling woman, unclothed, he declared. This is no explanation. The attitude of the Queen of Amor assumed the character of clear and unyielding aggression. If there were a woman, you would have fled from there long ago, she said. But if there really is a woman in the bedroom, let her come out and meet me now. And keep us company? She looked into Taman's eyes with a searching gaze. I'm very grateful to you for the offer, but I must decline. Taman bowed to the queen with the utmost courtesy. Something is not right here, Queen Teo concluded, looking at him. You look a bit too nervous. And then she exploded. Get away, she shouted. And with a sharp shove, literally blowing Taman out of the way, she swung open the door to the bedroom. Oh shit, Taman exclaimed. Queen Amora clenched her fists in anger and stormed into the bedroom. Huh, what kind of bitch is this? She shouted. To hide her like this. Theo moved determinedly toward the box, Taman barely keeping up. Rosalind wrapped her head in the blanket and lay there, not moving and barely breathing, hearing what a scandal was brewing and not knowing how it might end. Well, let's see, why are you so eager to hide it? The queen abruptly tore off the veil, not trusting Taman's words. 
And then she stopped like a stumbler, her eyes wide, her emotions extinguished. She saw the frightened woman before her, who was very good looking. Who? A woman indeed, she was confused, still holding Rosalind's torn blanket in her hands. The queen was stunned. Taman stood behind her, putting his hand to his forehead, not knowing what to do, waiting for what would happen and how it would end. The two women looked at one another, each thinking of something else. You've crossed the line, Taman began, trying to distract the queen. Wait a minute, she cut him off. Dazzling silver hair and amethyst eyes. I think I've heard that before. Is this the girl I heard you brought back from Thanatos? She asked. Taman stared at her in silence, wondering what to say. Then he found something to say. I don't know where you heard that. No one has seen what I have brought back from Thanatos. She never left my side for a second. How could they know if it was a thing or a person, your majesty, he said. The queen kept her arms crossed over her chest. She stood half turned toward him, obviously very displeased. Whoever it is, Taman continued a little more boldly. You must bring him to justice for giving false information, he said. The queen continued to stand in a closed posture. She was pondering, assessing the situation. All right, if you insist, she turned to him. But before you answer the question, what have you brought back from Thanatos? Oh, 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 Taman searched his mind for an answer. I brought back a deer skin with silver antlers, he lied. The two girls looked at him expressively. What? Teo asked. A deer skin with silver antlers? Is that true? She asked again. That means I'll get the only armor that can withstand all monsters' poisons, Teo exclaimed happily. And I had already given up. After all, these deer are almost extinct. She was excited and very happy. You should have brought the skin to the palace right away. Why did you hide it? She asked excitedly. She asked, what makes you think I'll give it away? I had a hard time getting this skin, Taman continued. The queen laughed. You clever boy. I'll get you anything you want, she promised. No, wait, who is she then? Can you answer that? And all attention returned to Rosalind. It is a woman, answered Taman without a joke. A woman whom I brought from Nerux at a special price. What, you bought a woman? Aren't you a sexual? Taya was surprised. Not at all, replied the young man. I have needs too. It was difficult to bring her in, had to pay four times as much, continued to explain himself. And now she's paying in full. And you? Who's never been interested in women? Why should I be? The queen continued to search for the truth. There are several reasons. Taman leaned over to Rosalind and took her chin. But the most important is that she looks like someone. Taman smiled. At last, he had found a wonderful explanation for everything. Hmm, I think I'm beginning to understand. Queen Teo said. I have not seen her in person, but there is indeed a resemblance to the Empress of Thanatos. Okay, where are you from? She asked Rosalind. Oh, God, now it was her turn to get out. She could not think of anything to say, but looked at the queen in silence. The queen looked at Rosalind, waiting for an answer to her question. So who is she? The queen continued her questioning, and then Rosalind found a way out. She took Taman's hand and began to speak emotionally and fearfully, looking him in the eye and pointing at the queen with a gesture of her head. Oh, Lord, who is she? If this is your wife, what will happen to me? Will you cast me out? Wow. Taman was amazed. The Hirush language. I wonder if she just speaks it that way or on purpose, knowing that Queen Teo is lenient with the Hirushans. Either way, he was very surprised by Rosalind's resourcefulness. She is the queen of this land. You have nothing to fear, my silver fox. And yes, know that I have no wife, he finished. Queen Teo was even more puzzled. What? So she's a slave from Hirushia? Yes, Taman replied. Despite her appearance, she is a Hirushan. Not so fluently in our language, though, he blurted out. But how could a Hirushan become a slave and make it all the way here? The queen became more and more confused. All right, what's your name? She asked. I apologize, Rosalind said. I still don't know your language very well. If you repeat the question again. She sat with her hands folded humbly in her lap. But at the same time, she was frantically trying to think of an answer. I asked you your name, Teo repeated. The girl collapsed. But then it hit her, and she perked up remembering the new name Taman had offered her the other day. My name is Erin Rosia, she said, smiling and putting her hand to her chest in relief. Erin Rosia, I wonder if she knows that with this name she herself becomes the sea, Taman thought. My name is Erin Rosia, Rosalind repeated. Of course, she didn't know that in an ancient, almost forgotten language, it means the most beautiful sea. But Taman did. The waves of the sea crashed against the rocks, now approaching the terrace of Taman's mansion, then receding into the distance. Rosalind, lying in bed, gazed through the panoramic glass at the seascape. How tired I am today, she thought. But her mind was still buzzing with thoughts, one after the other. Hmm, is this man a sexual? She remembered Queen Amor's statement. But to me, he sounds more like a lecherous pervert. A monster, she thought, remembering his molestation of her. How had he lived until now if he had no interest in women at all, she thought. 
What does it matter to me? What does that have to do with me? She shouted at herself. Yes, he was very ill yesterday, and I had to help him. Since he saved my life, I had to repay him. By the way, at that time they were talking about a deer with silver antlers. She thought for a moment and remembered some incidents concerning this kind of animal. They are known to be deer that are difficult to breed because of their aggressive and sensitive nature. In order to breed these creatures, the former emperor sent children to live in the herd. Afterwards, the surviving children live with the animals and tame them. Such children are called Lagor Lessi, and at this time there are only two such surviving children. They are a brother and a sister, Mira and Rashentia. Rosalind remembered in her mind all that connected her with the subject. Before her, kneeling before her, are these very children. They promise to obey only the words of the Empress and beg her to have mercy on them and to allow them to present their petitions to her. Have mercy on the deer which are hunted indiscriminately. They beg the Empress and protect us from the Emperor, they pleaded. Well, then promise them, Rosalind. She consoled and encouraged them. I will protect you as long as I live, Rosalind gave her word. This was the promise of the Empress Thanatos. Which means I have to do something about it, Rosalind thought, as she sat in Thanatos's bedroom. What is my silver fox thinking, she heard. And really, what is she thinking when she didn't even notice me coming in? Confused, Tamon approached Rosalind. Well, tell me, what's on your mind, he asked the girl, remembering all the twists and turns that had taken place during the Queen of Amor's visit, and the versions they had used to get out of the dangerous situation for both of them. Perhaps you were afraid that I would throw you out? He grinned, teasing Rosalind. Stop it, the girl replied. I don't want to be treated like a slave in your bed. Is that so? So you don't like the slave status? Taman continued to tease her. Then he continued, and the girl tensed in anticipation of what he would say next. What about the lover then? He asked, sitting down on the floor beside the bed and resting his head in her lap. The girl was at a loss. She had not expected such a proposal. But she also didn't like Taman's teasing and mannerisms. Quite a quick rise in status, isn't it? Just a few hours and you can jump several ranks at once. The young man laughed although his crude servant humor was rather inappropriate at the moment. Rosalind's previously familiar sense of herself as an icy woman returned. She very coldly pulled back Taman, who had gone wild. I've said it before, but to make it clearer, I'll say it again. I hate you. She sat up sharply in bed, her feet on the floor. Taman almost fell in surprise. The girl was cold and hard. Taman jumped up. Was what happened last night hate? It sounded passionate to me, he said. Can you make love that passionately to a man you can't stand? Uh, I, for one, am not, he went on, but Rosalind did not dignify him with an answer. She went to bed and covered herself with the bedspread as if it were a solid barrier between them. Taman crouched down on the edge of the bed, trying somehow to diffuse the situation and continue the dialogue, but Rosalind was speechless. She lay with her back to him, all her attention focused on the enchanting and soothing sight of the sea. Taman also sat quietly for a while, pondering what was happening. What? He heard it. What do you want from me? Rosalind said. I think I've answered that question before. Wasn't that enough? The girl remembered, yes, there had been such a conversation when he had told her what he wanted. I remember him saying that he liked my experience, my body, and my heart, and that he wanted it all. She was silent for a while. Then she turned to him and half sat down on the bed. You say you want me? She asked. Wow, I haven't forgotten, Taman said. It gave him pleasure. What are you up to? She looked at him with a penetrating gaze. Trust me, I'm not going to drag you into this, Taman said. But know only one thing, he said, leaning over the newly found lying woman, the palm of his hand resting on her headboard. You are already in my hands. Doubt it. Push it away, but. He leaned toward her and, smiling confidently, took her by the chin. You can never get rid of me, he said firmly. After a while, our heroes are sitting at the table. The chamberlain bowed respectfully and left. A couple is sitting opposite each other. The meal takes place, as usual, on the terrace. The waves of the sea are eager to reach them and attract the attention of Rosalind, who is now concentrating on something else. The girl was pensive, stern, concentrated on her inner reflections and experiences. Well, what happened yesterday happen again? She said suddenly. Taman almost choked when he heard her question at such a bad time. He chewed his food for a while in silence and thought about his answer. Perhaps, he said. What is the reason? Rosalind asked briefly. Her gaze was cold and watchful. There was tension in the air. Taman, however, continued his meal. Is it because of this strange ability you have? Rosalind continued to inquire as to what was troubling her. Of course, he answered. The power is out of control because you used it to save my life? You're only half right, Taman replied. And where did I go wrong, the girl clarified. First of all, the reason the power went out of control, Taman began to explain, was because I infused it into an unsealed partner. Isn't that divine power? This is the first time I've heard of such a method, Rosalind thought. 
Well, each ability is unique in its own way, Taman replied. I didn't know such conditions were necessary until I had the gift myself, he explained. Isn't this a disease passed down through generations in your family? Rosalind continued. I like your cleverness, Taman replied. Then when you seal the power on someone, what happened yesterday won't happen again, the girl clarified. I guess I don't know because I've never treated anyone like that before, Taman replied. But now I can find out, I'm sure. But if I can't seal the power, I might not live long, he said suddenly. The girl was stunned by this possibility. Then it's better to hurry, don't you think? She said worriedly. It is not that simple, he replied. As you've already noticed, my life force is mostly transferred through bodily fluids or proximity. Such things are done only when a strong bond has been established with a partner. Indeed, your power is as bold as its wielder, grinned Rosalind. Taman only smiled sheepishly and covered his eyes slightly. He placed his hand on hers, resting on the table. What are you? The girl perked up. Look, Timon continued. I'm so hot and healthy, he put her palm to his cheek. But because of the power, it's incumbent upon me to be cautious in my relationships. He continued to hold her hand, pressing his cheek against her palm. Just like he saved my life, she thought. So when he contacts someone, he transfers some of his power to his partner. The girl guessed. If I sleep with someone, they'll find out about my gift, Taman explained. Besides, the ability can get out of control like yesterday. Even though the merging of bodies doesn't mean the merging of abilities, if I don't tell her, she won't realize it, he thought. I can't sleep with all of them at once, he clarified. Rosalind snatched his hand away. But we stopped the sickness last night, so I think we'll be okay for a while, he told her. The girl thought about what she had heard. How interesting, Taman said. You hate me so much that you're willing to kill me. But your expression is as if you feel guilty that I arbitrarily saved you. That's not true, said the girl, and turned away, trying to hide her true feelings. Don't worry, Rosalind, he said. No, Aaron Rosha. Asha, he called her by her diminutive name. I don't want to see your frowning face. It's not your fault. Yes, it is. This is all your whim. I didn't ask you to save me. Rosalind reacts very emotionally. That's right. That's true, Taman said. Then what's wrong with your face? He looked at her questioningly. Even now, despite your integrity, you feel responsible for my power getting out of control. The girl realized that this was indeed the case. Let me imprint it into you, Aaron Rossia, Taman said after a short silence. The girl thought about what she had heard. In front of us is a metal cage through which we can see the sea. There are voices nearby. Let's set sail now. When everything is loaded, let's go. Someone gives an order to the crew. Eh? What's that? The sound of voices brought Arson to his senses. He found himself sitting in a cage. The cage was solid. Arson was impressed and very upset by what had happened. The grating revealed the rough sea and the overcast, heavy sky. Am I on a ship? He guessed. Is this really human trafficking? It was not in his plans. After all, he had promised to complete Empress Thanatos' mission in a short time. Two men stopped not far from the cage where Arson was being held. Let me out of here now, he shouted. Kidnapping and slavery are illegal, in case you didn't know. This boy is so loud, said one. Shut up, huh? Shouted the other. Do you want to drown in the sea while being locked up? How dare you? Let me out now, shouted the man. I belong to the Imperial Academy. Do you hear me? He tried to influence his attackers. Shut up, he heard. And the grate through which he could see and breathe was closed, something like a shield. Some kind of gas was being shot through the hole in the center. He found himself in a closed room. He was scared and stuffy. Arson tried to close his airway by hugging his forearm, but it didn't help. He fell to his knees, panting. Then he collapsed on the floor, exhausted. I have to get out of here, but I can't make a sound. My mind is racing and already losing consciousness. He suddenly noticed that his necklace was glowing. What is it? That's all he could think. We're back with our heroes, Rosalind and Taman. They're still sorting things out. So what? I'm supposed to let you do this? She asked the young man. Yes, he said. Then my ability will stabilize. We will become partners and you will wield the same power as I do. I don't need that, said the girl. I'll take away your pain and your wounds. Or is there something else you want? Taman smiled. I want nothing, Rosalind replied confidently. Taman was silent for a moment. What about an ever faithful animal? He asked, placing his hand over hers again. You seem to be aware that you look like a beast, the girl parried. I swear I will never betray you, Taman continued. No, you will betray me if necessary, Rosalind replied. Don't hold me to your standards, the young man resented. Tell me, did you think the same of all the men who swore allegiance to you? He looked expressively at his companion. What? She asked, a bit confused. Never mind, he replied. You may believe them, but not me. I know it's hard to trust someone like me, he said. But if you change your mind, you can always talk to me. If that's possible, he said, wiping his mouth with a napkin. But I'd like an answer before the power gets out of control again. He gave the girl a puzzled look. She looked at him closely. 
A young couple sits on the second floor of the terrace where the sea waves do not reach. The view of the sea from this point is still beautiful, but they do not seem to care for it today. Night has fallen on Amor. All the inhabitants of Taman's domain began to prepare for sleep. In the morning, Rosalind was visited by the Foxy twins. They sat on chairs next to the bed where Rosalind lay and chirped without closing their mouths. It had been over a month since Mrs. Asha had come to the manor. In fact, after you arrived, we were inspired and began writing a novel. In between other chatter, the girls shared with her. A novel? Rosalind wondered. Yes, the girls replied. It's a passionate melodrama about a silver-haired beauty who is captured, and the red-eyed general of the desert land of Cayman. The girls continued to chatter, interrupting each other, trying to acquaint Mrs. Asha with the plot of the book. There was a silent question in Rosalind's eyes. The obsessed general never left the princess alone for a moment, and in the end, she fell in love with him. The girls continued to tell the plot of their book. We've written about half of it, and the printer loves it. They shared their progress. On second thought, what country could it be? Thanatos? Their empress also has silver hair and violet eyes, one of the twins reasoned. But of course, for us, Lady Asha is much, much prettier, one began. That's right, affirmed the other. Thank you. Very interesting indeed. Rosalind complimented them. Show it to me later when you're done, okay? I'd love to, the girls replied with glee, clenching their fists and not holding back in their movements and emotions. Eh, I think it's better if you don't see him, Arel said as she entered the bedroom. They said it was a passionate melodrama, but in reality, it's not clear how vulgar it is, Mrs. Asha, said Arel. Hey, Arel, one of them called to the maid. A love scene is not to be missed in a man-woman relationship, she explained in a warning tone with a thumbs up. That's right, the other one got it. You gave birth to three children. Don't you know that? He put both hands on his cheeks, expressing his surprise, and laughed at the woman. You rascals. What has this got to do with children? The maid even dropped the basket of linen on the floor in indignation. Oh, Arel. You're so red, they laughed. What were you thinking about that made your face so red? They laughed with laughter. Stop it, both of you, said Rosalind, who watched with a smile. The moon rose again over Taman's estate. The courtyard of the estate was clean, tidy, and well-kept. The peace of the night came. Taman and Rosalind lay in bed. He held her close in his arms. Rosalind thought, unlike Thanatos, it's peaceful here. But am I really allowed to do nothing? Several days later, Mrs. Asha, would you like to go outside today? The twins stood at her door, smiling, happy, and very agile as always. Yes, a walk would be a good idea. You've been sitting here the whole time. Cue the other sister. Soldiers everywhere. Aren't they watching me? Rosalind thought as Arel helped her tidy up, brushing her beautiful hair. Could this really be the way? The girl came out of the bedroom, accompanied by the giggling twins. They were immediately approached by a group of armed men, their faces covered with bandages. And Mrs. Asha, be careful. The girls held Rosalind down the stairs. They were followed by a whole squad of warriors. Apparently, they were to escort the girl on her way. It's all right. I'm just limping a little, Rosalind said. The girls were surprised. One of them took her hand compassionately. Stairs can be dangerous. I'm just worried about you. Are all these soldiers really my bodyguards? Rosalind wondered. If so, there are twice as many as when I was empress, she thought. Maybe I should have stayed in the room, she said, glancing at her escort. Why? Even the carriage should be ready by now, one of the girls said. A carriage? You mean the carriage that aristocrats ride in? Yes, that's it. A carriage drawn by a pair of white horses stood before them. Hmm. You all know me as the slave in his bed, but a carriage? What does this have to do with my position? There are rumors among the servants, Rosalind thought. No, you should have stayed in your room. Didn't you want to go for a walk? Taman came out to meet her. Too many chaperones. She shared her impressions. Taman looked at her carefully. There are only ten of them. What's the problem? He asked. Even Thanatos had less. Even though I'm no longer the Empress, she announced. That's right, you are Aaron Rosha of Amor, Taman smiled. And my beautiful slave in the bed. Again, he returned to the subject that irritated her. I think I must find a way to die again, Rosalind said. Better that than to live as a slave for carnal pleasure. As expected, you're very clever. You know what the word die does to me. And you make threats without end, he laughed. Since Taman, being of low origin, must bow his head, he bowed low playfully. The girl became angry. She turned abruptly to walk away from him, but he caught her by the arm. Let go. She was angry with him, but Taman pacified her by promising not to tease her again. If you go, it will really hurt me, he said sincerely. The girl listened to him discreetly, but already more leniently. That's it. That's it. I understand already. Will you let go of my hand? Is it still hard for you to ride in the carriage? He asked her. The girl was silent for a while, listening to how she felt, and then agreed that yes, for now it was uncomfortable. Timon waited for her answer and decided that in that case, it would be possible to change the plan of the previously planned walk. 
So he suggested that she walk to the sea near the mansion. The girl's response was quite positive. The sea. She obviously liked it and even enjoyed it. A view of the azure sea. Seagulls flying and screeching over the surface. Palm trees, sand, waves rolling up to the shore. It was spectacular, especially for Rosalind, who was deprived of such beauties. She and Taman, dressed in light, colorful clothes, stood on the shore. A light sea breeze ruffled her long hair. The girl was fascinated by all this and smiled involuntarily, not controlling her emotions. Taman smiled as well. He was pleased with the views of nature and the sight of Rosalind's exalted state. How is it? It's huge, isn't it? He asked. I want to look at it all day, the girl admitted. She was under the aesthetic impression and influence of positive emotions. Her soul and heart were no longer stiff, stiff, icy. The girl had been thinking about something of her own for some time. Taman, at last she spoke. The man looked at her intently. You wanted it, she began, then fell silent, gathering her thoughts. You wanted to imprint me with your power? Taman listened to her with interest, without interrupting. You know, I get it. I realized that I, who decided to die, am different from the one who's ready to live. She excitedly told him about her discovery. Since you saved me, you must take responsibility for this. I hope you have the determination to do at least that, don't you? Now you look a bit like your old self. Taman even got goosebumps and cheekbones from the change in Rosalind. All right, have it your way, she said. But in return, you will grant me my wish. That sounds like a bargain to me, Taman said. That's what it is, replied the girl. Will you make a bargain with me, Taman Krasis? Hmm, that's good to hear. A deal means that everyone should get something out of it. Well, in return, I'll grant you three wishes, he offered. That's not enough. Make it five, Rosalind bargained. Ah, come on, ask for more, Aaron Rosia, Taman thought. All right, have it your way, he said aloud. Don't fall in love either, she continued. Here, Taman tensed. I know you want me, but it's best to limit it to that, the girl said, taking a closed pose and turning away slightly. For Taman, that was the equivalent of a low blow. I knew she wasn't longing for love. But why did her words make me feel as if everything in me had been turned upside down? Did you think I loved you? How impertinent of you. After he had recovered a little, he said, Well, if not, it is well, smiled Rosalind with relief. And if I refuse this condition, he asked, then we shall consider that there was no bargain between us. Well, I'm in trouble. But you can't control your heart. What if I happen to fall in love with you? Oh, well. And then you'll be the one to end our affair. She had an answer for that, too. It would not be so easy for a man with the gift of God, said Taman. But the girl parried by saying that it was possible with the help of a scroll in the great temple. Created by borrowing the power of God, it has special properties. I have one, so we'll use it. But you don't have one, Taman said in surprise. If I ask at the temple in Garcia, I can get it. It's stored there under another name. Taman was furious, clenching his fists and barely holding back his emotions. Will she act like this until the end, he thought. But aloud, he agreed with the set condition and said, okay. But there's something else he said curiously. What if you fall in love with me? What then? Taman took her chin in his hand and looked deep into her eyes. The girl froze for a moment. That will never happen, she replied confidently. But if it happens, then do what you want, she finished. Her cheek rested on his palm, her hand holding his wrist. If you wish to keep the bond, keep it. If you wish to break it, break it. Taman was relieved. I like that, he smiled. Then let's put the deal down on paper, she said, taking his hand away. Wait, he said. We've only heard your demands. We must add mine as well. The girl concentrated. Let's go. She waited for Taman's conditions. Her right foot. Rosalind looked at the leg, not realizing what he meant. What, my leg? She cried out emotionally. They both stood and looked at her right leg. Taman was silent. Shall I cut off my leg? The girl did not understand and did not know what to think. Taman looked at her, surprised to hear her version. But then he smiled. If anything, it's better that you keep her with you. The girl was uncomfortable at his words. What are you going to do with my leg? She asked, waiting for an answer. I don't know, Taman smiled. Well, stuff. Just say you'll give it back. It's only a leg, the girl thought. All right, take it, she made up her mind. Taman knelt before her. The girl waited to see how it would end. All right, Taman said. Now he took the girl by the ankle. This foot is mine. He brought her foot to his lips. There is no doubt that this man is definitely a pervert, Rosalind concluded. Palace of Thanatos. A cough is heard from the emperor's bedroom. The emperor sits up in bed and coughs. Johan, he calls for a servant. This medicine does not work. Bring another at once, right now. He shouts angrily at the servant who appears. Your majesty, the servant tries to justify himself and convince the emperor. The doctor said that any other medicine would only make the situation worse. Damn it. My heart feels like it's about to explode and you tell me to bear it? You want me to die right now? Guillotti screamed, unable to contain himself. You, 
Surely you are not the Empress's remaining puppet. He rebuked, accused, suspected his servant. What do you mean, why your majesty? He replied, trembling like an aspen leaf. Johann, who has been at your side since he was 10 years old, how can I deceive his majesty? The servant tried to explain. Shit. Shit. That's all I heard from the emperor. This is the curse of the empress, that damned woman, the emperor shouted in anger and fear. Poisonous viper. Go immediately and tell them to set fire to the Sunset family mansion, he ordered. What? The servant was surprised. Yes, let them wait so that only ashes remain in its place, ordered Emperor Guillotti. Also, dig up the coffin of the former duke, he shouted out of breath and throw it into the fire. Why, your majesty, a servant tried to dissuade the emperor. But Guillotti interrupted him, threatening that if he did not obey the command, his throat would be cut. Listen, bowed the servant. K -k 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 -k, continued the emperor's cough. Well then, Empress, let's see who wins, you or me. Guillotti continued to wrestle in his mind with the deposed Empress Rosalind. The young men ate in the open air. Our queen is very suspicious and has good instincts, Taman said, but she can also be quite normal. He shared his impressions with his companion. Last time we managed to cover ourselves with a silver-horned deerskin, he said, but we still feel uneasy. Why is that? asked Rosalind, who was listening intently. Taman leaned back on the table and almost dropped his fork in his deep thoughts. I have noticed that there are a great many curious eyes about lately, he said. As I understand it, you and the queen have a pretty good relationship, so why the spies, Rosalind reasoned. I told you about the queen's good instincts, and she trusts it very much, Taman replied. It's very likely that Thea Rancha sensed something was wrong the day she visited us, but she could not question us further for lack of proof. So she sent spies. Rosalind pondered what she had heard. She had lost her appetite. Why don't you eat anymore, Taman asked her. She was full, she replied, but the reason was clearly something else. But this won't last, Taman laughed. Hold out? What do you mean? Rosalind asked. He must be talking about imprinting, she thought at once. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you think. Isn't there another way? Asked the girl. Who knows? Replied Taman. She became embarrassed and began to involuntarily rub the tablecloth on the table. Oh, ho, ho, thought Rosalind, and I fell for his face again. Well, what's the problem? Taman asked. Nothing, Rosalind said. She didn't really want to explain to him what was happening to her. Would she? That's what I thought. A servant came to them and offered them a new seafood dish. It is oyster charpus, a seafood that is hard to find, Taman explained. Oysters? The so-called oysters? Yes, Rosalind asked. I don't think you've ever tasted them. I recommend it. It's quite an interesting taste, he suggested to her, nibbling happily at a clam himself. Rosalind took a forkful of oyster meat and brought it to her mouth. For a while, she tried to taste the flavors of the dish. By the look on your face, you liked it, commented Timon. He continued. Did you know that this food has a special meaning? Are you interested? Well, Rosalind waited for an explanation. It is also called the groaning of the bride, continued Taman. This dish is usually eaten on the wedding night. Rosalind was obviously embarrassed. She covered her mouth with a serviette. It is said that if eaten, it will cause the bride to scream uncontrollably in bed. But we can see if it's true tonight, Taman suggested. Taman Krasis, Rosalind shouted sharply at him and pulled herself up from the table. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Has the effect of the court already begun? Taman laughed out loud. How can that be? It's still far into the night, he teased. Rosalind crumpled the tablecloth in anger. She left the table. Handsome Taman looked with expressive eyes at the young woman who had grown so beautiful of late. He watched with interest to see what would happen next. Rosaline approached and kicked him with her foot. Taman cried out in surprise and pain, but continued to laugh at her. Kicking already? Look what a wild mistress she is, he commented, stroking the bruise. Please be quiet, just for a minute, Rosalind cried. All right, all right, he agreed, reassuring her. Just stop being angry. And so today's outdoor meal ended. We see Lanasso again, galloping at full speed. Has something happened again? Sir, the servant greeted him courteously. What brings you here in the middle of the night? Where is Taman? asked the guest excitedly. I have something to tell him. Just gone to the bathroom, the servant replied. At this hour, Lanasso was surprised. All right, I'll wait. Let him know I'm here. Phew, he collapsed on the couch from exhaustion. A servant offered him some tea. Time passed, but Taman still didn't appear. What's taking him so long? Is he getting ready for his wedding night or something? Lonasso laughed. Where the hell is he? After some more time and tired of waiting, the guest was already angry and indignant. It was then that Taman appeared behind him. What's the urgent matter since you came so late? He asked. Lonasso turned around. Well, at last. I thought you were drowned or dead. He pulled his friend up. Wow, you took a scented bath, he asked. And not so long ago, I hated the smell of water, he remarked. People change. So what's going on? Taman asked. 
You should know that the queen has spies in your house. When I came, I saw people hiding in the mansion as well. What happened? What does this have to do with anything? Lonasso asked excitedly. Yes, I'm busted, Taman replied, spreading his hands. What? What are you talking about? His comrade shouted. The queen recently entered my house and then broke into my bedroom, he began to tell his companion. And then what happened? The latter wondered. I had to make it up as I went along. I said that I had brought a slave girl who looked like this woman. Lanasso opened his mouth. And did she believe it? If she did, there wouldn't be so many spies around, Taman thought. That's true, Lanasso agreed. What will you do? When the queen finds out who this woman is, she won't just let it go. Taman sat thinking and sipped his tea. So what? He asked then. Do you think she can take them from me? He put down the cup. Well, yes, you can do it yourself. All right, Lanasso said, this is what I'm here for. He handed Taman a scroll. Take a look. There was a question in Taman's eyes. This is the scroll I found at the auction yesterday. I brought it because I thought it would be of great interest to you. Taman unrolled the scroll and began to read what was written. This is life. Seal yourself before the sixth moon sets and the fifth night ends. Save the Iron Child from crossing the sea before it reaches land. If you cannot, her treasure will be lost again. Hmm, life and death sounds like a prophecy of divine power. Besides, it's a Hyrish language. Taman thought for a moment. I wonder if anyone knew of our plans. Who else have you shown this to? He asked. Only you, Lanasso replied. I'm done with auctions, but I went to buy a birthday present for my little brother. And I found this. Taman was puzzled. All right, keep it a secret, he asked. Meanwhile, Rosalyn was enjoying herself immensely, lying in the bathtub with rose petals and whole blossoms floating around her. Oh, what an immense pleasure it was. But what's wrong with me? It's only an imprint, she persuaded herself, lying in the bathtub and covering her eyes with pleasure, tracing the appearance of some stirring emotion. It's just a deal, nothing more, she convinced herself, stepping barefoot on the wooden grating on the floor. Her excitement, however, was visible not only to herself, but also to the girls who helped her dress after her bath. The girls were delighted at the sight of her freshness and a special, easily readable inner sensuality. But why am I so nervous, she thought. And so the time came. Rosalind stands anxiously near the entrance to the bedroom. Everything in her is shaking. The girl tries to remain calm, but her thoughts are only of what is about to happen. She pulls herself together, concentrates, prepares for her decisive and, as we see, not so easy and not at all indifferent step. Rosalind covers her eyes, exhales, prepares, and finally grasps the doorknob. She stepped into the room, and it was so exciting. The girl looked around. Taman wasn't in the bedroom. He hasn't come yet, she thought. What should I do? Well, Rosalind crouched down on the edge of the bed. For some time, she was in a state of bewilderment, confusion, uncertainty. She waited for Taman to come. Then she was reminded of a similar situation when she was once married to Emperor Gyo of Thanatos. At that time, she had been sitting on the bridal bed in the Imperial Palace, waiting for His Majesty to appear. She remembered how the bedroom door had swung open and Guillot had burst into the room. He was already quite drunk, with an uncorked bottle of wine in his hand. His appearance did not evoke any positive emotions or feelings. He reeked of alcohol, his eyes were angry, and he was a most unpleasant sight. Rosalind sat with her hands folded humbly in her lap. Are you sure you're not dead? He asked suddenly, looking at her. How am I to sleep with one whose skin is whiter than snow? Guillot continued. The girl said nothing, just listened to his attacks, not knowing what to say or how to act in such a situation. Only her violet eyes reflected pain and resentment. Guillot grinned. He was very displeased. Oh, those eyes. You know how many men they've driven mad. Guillot threw the bottle on the ground in anger. It shattered, spilling its contents. It was so vile and disgusting, Rosalind remembered. Purple is the color of the dead, Guillot continued. Don't look at me. You are dead, he shouted. No feelings, no joy, eh? You don't experience them yourself, and you are not meant to experience them. The girl was forced to sit meekly and listen to everything the drunken emperor said. You don't even answer because you are dead, he shouted. And so she sits in the bedroom again, waiting for the man. Yes, this kind of treatment, she remembered, and with time I even got used to it. The girl thought for a moment. Because of your splendor, I don't even know where to put myself. Suddenly she heard. In front of her stood Taman, dressed up, luxurious, with a basket of flowers and fruit. He's finally here. The man approached her. He came to the place where Rosalind was sitting and went down on one knee. To me, you are like a gift for which I have waited a very, very long time, he said, looking at her with admiration. The girl sat with her eyes wide open, embarrassed and blushing at the compliments the charming man paid her. You probably don't know, Taman continued, sitting down beside her, that from the moment I picked you up, every day of my life has been perfect. Everything was so different for Rosalind. The girl closed her eyes, 
listening and absorbing everything he told her. Then she realized, no, you can't fall for his face, she reminded herself. How can you say shameful things so carelessly, she said, trying to say it dryly. That's my charm, Taman laughed. Rosalind lowered her eyes. A jug of wine was in Taman's hands. Let's have a glass, he suggested, to take the edge off. The girl looked at him. There was no objection. Well, then he brought closer the basket of flowers and fruit, poured wine into glasses. They drank a toast to a faultless and perfect bargain. The young men drank. What is it called? Hapwanju? asked Taman. We will clue our viewer in that this is the name of the alcoholic beverage that the bride and groom drink when they pass a shot glass to each other during the traditional wedding ceremony. It's a tradition for newlyweds, Rosalind said. Taman laughed. And is it also said that one must be drunk before a man and a woman spend the night together? Or is that not true? He looked at the girl mischievously. Rosalind answered, true. But now, is this some kind of romantic moment? Turning to the man, she asked. They were sitting on the edge of the bed. They held glasses of wine. Their eyes were fixed on each other. Taman was very handsome at that moment. His gaze penetrated her soul. He spoke. My heart is beating so hard that I think it's going to explode. So I thought it was a bit romantic. Or is it? He asked. Or am I the only one who feels this way? You know, it's a little hurtful and sad. He went on. Rosalind remained silent. Then she said, if your heart really explodes, I'll believe it. How can you speak such cruel words with lips that kissed me so passionately? Taman, stop being so frivolous. You speak like a man who has no shame. Shame? Do not seek what I do not have. He began to laugh again. Rosalind looked at him. He raised his glass and drank the drink in it in one gulp. Okay, I got it. That's enough. Taman refilled the glass. I will stop teasing you. So calm down. And don't drink anymore, okay? Why? Rosalind asked. Well, you know, he touched his palm to her face and ran his hand down her cheek. The girl blushed and trembled at his touch. Taman smiled. The wine spilled from the glass that had fallen from her hands. That's because you can't be too nervous and relaxed, he said. The man approached her, and resting his hands on the bed, hovered with his whole body over Rosalind. The girl looked up at him. Who? Who is it that is fidgeting? Rosalind suddenly exclaimed, clumsily trying to hide her emotions. She was already lying on the bed, and the expected event was about to happen. I am, he replied. I was too nervous, and now I'm hardly relaxed. He went on, and the fingers of their hands intertwined. So, he said, leaning right up to her face. Come, let's begin. Taman put his arms around her and kissed her gently but firmly. He supported her on her head and waist. Rosalind returned the kiss and placed her hands on his shoulders. Queen Amor's palace. Emotional exclamations could be heard from the royal chambers. Is this so? Had he really never left the house in all that time? She asked the man and woman standing before her, spying on Taman's domain on her behalf. That's right, they replied. Strange, the queen said, thinking for a moment. No matter how huge his palace was, it would be stuffy to stay there for so long. And boring, she thought. Teo stood in front of the window but could see nothing beyond it, only the blurred silhouette of her reflection, and thought, thought, thought. She had been thinking about Taman and his secret for the last few days. I wonder if that's what you're thinking about, Taman, she asked him mentally. And she remembered how, trying to explain something to her, he had said, I don't know who could have told you that, and where did you hear it? No one saw what I brought. This is the woman I brought from Nurkus after paying a special price for her. She continued to remember Taman's explanations. I thought he had brought an empress, but he said it was a slave girl from Nurkus. But Taman isn't the kind of man who would lie to me, is he? Still, something isn't right. Hmm, Nurkus? Is that woman a slave from there? Tio continued to think. Well, no, be that as it may, this individual worries me, Queen Amora summarized.